The Gray Phantom by Herman Landon. Chapter Twelve. Mr. Shea Strikes. A fine drizzle was in the air, and the street lights emitted a blurred and languid sheen. For an hour the gray phantom had been pacing the sidewalks across the street from the Whipple Hotel, impatiently waiting for the lights in Mr. Fairspeckle's suite to go out. His coat collar was turned up, and the brim of his soft hat was pulled low over his forehead. Taking Culligore's warning to heart, he had resolved not to endanger his project by running unnecessary risks. The passing pedestrians gave him scarcely a glance, and he told himself that the inclement weather was a point in his favor. Evidently neither Culligore nor Starr had mentioned his presence in the city, for he could see no signs of accelerated activity on the part of the police, as there would have been if the news had leaked out that the gray phantom had come out of hiding. The solitary watcher whom he had seen from the window of Mr. Fairspeckle's bedroom earlier in the day had evidently quitted his task, for he was nowhere in sight. Throughout the late afternoon and early evening, the phantom had been harassed by fears for Helen's safety. At times he had scarcely been able to control his impatience, but his eagerness had been cooled by the knowledge that a headlong rush into danger would only render the situation worse. His interview with Culligore had not only helped to clarify his mind, but it had left him with a renewed conviction that the emaciated and dour-looking ex-financier was Mr. Shea. Again he cast a speculative glance at the windows of Mr. Fairspeckle's apartment. All the lights but one had been extinguished since he last looked in that direction, and he guessed that his occupant had retired to his bedroom. His imagination pictured the old man sleeplessly pacing the floor, chuckling softly to himself while his mind evolved nefarious schemes. It was the phantom's plan to take him completely by surprise, and if possible, wring a confession from him. But above all else, he was determined to ascertain whether Fairspeckle knew anything about Helen's whereabouts. He waited fifteen minutes longer, then adjusted his hat and collar, and walked briskly across the street. With the air of one belonging on the premises, he entered the hotel, and, not thinking it safe to use the elevator, walked toward the stairway in the rear. A few drowsy loungers sat in chairs in the lobby and the clerk was engaged with a late arrival, so no one noticed him. The long, heavily carpeted hallways were silent and deserted, for the Whipple was catering chiefly to the staid and respectable element that retires early and sleeps soundly. The phantom ascended three flights of stairs, then turned down the corridor toward Mr. Fairspeckle's apartment. Reaching the door, he stopped and listened, but no sound came from the interior. After a cautious glance behind him, he took from his pocket a compact case, which he always carried when engaged in enterprises like the present, and from its silk-lined grooves extracted a small metallic tool. In a few moments the lock had yielded to his deft manipulation, and he stepped inside. Again he stopped and listened. The hallway in which he stood was lighted only by a tiny electric bulb in the ceiling, and its glow was so faint that the surrounding objects were scarcely distinguishable. At first he could not hear the slightest sound, and he was about to proceed when a curious impression caused him to draw in his steps. Perhaps his imagination was deceiving him, but he thought someone was sobbing and he had a distinct impression that the sounds were coming from the door at his left. In an instant he had pressed his ear against the keyhole. Now he could hear the sounds quite clearly, but the sob-like effect was gone, and instead they made him think of someone gasping and spluttering. Mystified, he tried the lock and pushed the door open. 
the room was dark and he ran his hand along the wall until he found the electric switch as the light flashed on a mutter of amazement fell from his lips on a bed at the farther end of the room with hands and feet bound and gag firmly adjusted to his mouth lay hayuto the servant a look of mute pleading in his bulging eyes was tugging impotently at the ropes around his ankles and wrists what's happened sharply inquired the phantom but renewed splutterings called his attention to the fact that the gag prevented Hayuto from speaking. He removed the cloth while repeating the question. Hayuto, breathing hard, licked the bruised portion of his mouth. "'Don't know,' he finally managed to say. "'I sleep, then noise at door. Before I can get up, somebody walk in. All is dark, like tomb of Ieyasu. I get awful crack on head then sleep again. Don't know anything else." With a moan, Hayuto sank back against the pillow. A startling suspicion flashed through the phantom's mind. Without troubling to release the servant's limbs, he ran from the room and opened a door at the farther end of the hall. He had thought it led into Fairspeckle's bedroom, but his sense of direction had become somewhat confused and he found himself in the library instead. Faintly through the darkness, he glimpsed the bright nickel trimmings of the typewriter at which the ex-financier had been at work earlier in the day. He groped his way across the floor, turning in the direction where he thought Fairspeckle's bedroom was. A soft tinkle brought him to a dead stop. The telephone was ringing. Acting on impulse, he fumbled about in the dark till he found the instrument, then lifted the receiver to his ear and spoke a low response into the transmitter. The answering voice sent a quiver through his being. He recognized it at once, for he had heard it before. "'Mr. Shea speaking,' it was saying, and the cold, precise tones were edged with a taunt. I perceive you have chosen to disregard the warning I gave you a few hours ago. Unless you abandon your plans at once, Miss Hardwick will die. That is absolutely final." A faint click signified that the connection was broken. For a few moments the phantom stood rigid, scarcely able to comprehend the import of the message. It had been spoken in tones so emphatic and sinister that he was left in no doubt regarding the speaker's sincerity. But how had the man at the other end of the wire learned that the phantom was in Fairspeckle's apartment? The telephone call, coming a few minutes after the phantom's arrival, had been so accurately timed as to indicate that he had been followed to the Whipple. Yet that did not seem quite possible for he had been particularly alert against that very thing. Finally, he put the telephone down. He tried to stifle the new and poignant misgivings with which the voice had inspired him. He remembered the other message he had received from the person purporting to be Mr. Shea. He had been deceived then, unless his own and Culligore's deductions were all wrong, and he would not be so easily imposed upon again. Doubtless, the second message, like the first, was only a clever hoax on Fairspeckle's part. Well, in a few moments he would probably know the truth. His fears and doubts were only partly quieted when he stepped softly from the room. Time and again there flashed through his mind a suspicion that something was wrong with the theory Culligore had implanted in his mind, but his thoughts in this direction were hazy. The binding and gagging of Hayuto was a disquieting and perplexing circumstance that did not seem to fit into the woof of the lieutenant's ideas in regard to Fairspeckle. The phantom passed through another door, then stopped short and stared in astonishment at the scene that met his eyes. He was in Mr. Fairspeckle's bedroom. A single electric light, 
the one he had seen while standing on the sidewalk opposite the hotel, glowed softly in a wall fixture. In a Morris chair in the middle of the room, with the folds of a dressing gown hanging loosely over his bony frame, sat W. Rufus Fairspeckle. He sat so still that if his eyes had been closed, the phantom would have suspected that he was either asleep or dead. He was bound and gagged in the same manner as Hayuto had been. But it struck the phantom as vaguely significant that his right arm was bared to the elbow. As he stepped closer, he became oddly impressed by the strange expression in the old man's eyes. They looked straight ahead in a fixed, unseeing way, and there was a gleam of merriment in their dim depths that clashed sharply with the pallor in the shrunken cheeks. It seemed as though Fairspeckle's soul was indulging in fancies of which his physical self was unaware, and the whole effect impressed the phantom as uncanny. He leaned forward and examined the exposed arm. Just below the muscles of the elbow, and directly over one of the smaller veins, was a puncture and a congealed drop of blood. The puncture was so small that it might have been inflicted with a needle prick. In a roundabout way, the phantom's mind went back to the scene in the Thelma Theater as it had been pictured in the newspapers and with an inward start he remembered that just such a puncture had been found on the right arm of Virginia Darrow. Though as yet he could not grasp the meaning of it, the coincidence acted as an electric shock on his nerves. He tore away the gag from the old man's lips and vigorously shook his arm. "'What's the matter?' he inquired. The red eyelids quivered a little. The look of hilarity flickering in the depths of the orbs grew a trifle more pronounced. It was almost gruesome, but the phantom's sense of perplexity was stronger than his repugnance. "'Can't you speak?' he asked sharply. "'What is the meaning of this?' Fairspeckle's chest heaved feebly. The motion was accompanied by a plucking movement of the fingers. The hands and feet strained impotently against the fettering cords. Then the lips fluttered, exposing a row of uneven teeth, and in the next instant a shiver ran down the phantom's spine. Through the fluttering lips came a laugh such as he had never before heard. It sounded hollow and cracked, and as unreal as if produced by a mechanical contrivance. The phantom had an uncanny sensation that the dead, if they were capable of producing sounds, might laugh just like that. Then he remembered the vivid descriptions he had read of the mocking laughter that had come from Virginia Darrow's dying lips, and a hazy suspicion entered his mind. He took a jackknife from his pocket and swiftly slashed the cords around Fairspeckle's arms and legs. Although released from his bonds, the man in the chair scarcely moved. The feet scraped gently against the floor, and the arms fell limply to his sides. Weird snatches of laughter were still trickling through his lips, but the expression of insane merriment in his eyes was slowly yielding to a look of returning reason. The phantom looked helplessly about him, and suddenly his eyes fell on a sheet of paper lying at the old man's feet. Mechanically he picked it up and glanced at the typewritten lines. From the smudged and indistinct type he was vaguely aware that he was gazing at a carbon copy. A word here and there attracted his attention, and presently he was reading the communication from the beginning. It read, Dear friend, the poison which has been injected into your veins tonight has been accurately adjusted to produce death within seven days. You will have lucid intervals, but you will be gradually growing weaker and weaker. Consult as many high-priced specialists as you wish, and if they can help you, you are to be congratulated. 
there is only one antidote, and that is the secret of a confederate of mine. It will be supplied you for a consideration. The exact terms will be communicated to you in a few days. By that time you will probably have been convinced that your life is absolutely in my hands. If misery loves company, I trust you will find consolation in the fact that six others are in precisely the same predicament as yourself. Mr. Shea The sheet dropped from the phantom's fingers. If what he had just read seemed grotesque and absurd, a glance at the man in the chair conferred a semblance of hideous reality upon it. Mr. Shea had struck the threatened blow, and he had struck sooner than expected. Fairspeckle's laughter had ceased, and a look of reason was coming into his waxen features. The expression of ribald mockery had left his eyes, and now they were fixed on the phantom's face in a dull, suspicious stare. With a start, the phantom awoke to a realization of his predicament. If he were caught in Fair Speckle's apartment, the police and the public would be firmly convinced of what they already suspected, that Mr. Shea and the phantom were one. Not even Culligore's keen mind and generous impulses would suffice to save him from arrest and imprisonment. And there was Helen. The thought gave him a spinal chill. Perhaps at this very moment she was confronted by some terrifying peril. And if he were arrested, then his last chance of helping her would be gone. His mind made up, the phantom ran to the telephone in the adjoining room. He called a number, and presently he was answered by an operator at police headquarters. His inquiry for Culligore elicited the information that the lieutenant was out and would probably not return until morning. The phantom hesitated for a moment, then spoke hurriedly into the transmitter. This is important. Send a doctor and a couple of detectives at once to the Whipple Hotel, Suite 36. You will find something very interesting. That's all. With that he hung up, and a few moments later he had left the apartment and was briskly walking down the stairs. Chapter 13 A Message from Mr. Shea The city, consuming the news of Mr. Shea's amazing coup, along with its coffee and toast the following morning, reacted to the sensation much as a child might react to the sight of a fabled monster. The whole affair seemed monstrous, unbelievable, and yet the facts could not be reasoned away. Seven of the city's wealthiest men had been inoculated with a malady of such a mysterious nature that the most celebrated physicians in New York City had admitted they were unable to diagnose it. An air of bafflement and suspense hung over the city. Mr. Shea's name was on every tongue and the blow he had struck was discussed by groups that gathered on street corners, in cafes, and in public squares. Among the seven victims were several of the most important capitalists in the country, so the effect of Mr. Shea's astounding maneuver was an assault on the financial nerve center of the nation. The name that, next to Mr. Shea's, was most often spoken in the street corner discussions was that of the gray phantom. The spectacular nature of the coup, as well as the daring and resourcefulness exhibited by its perpetrator, seemed ample proof that the gray phantom had returned to his old ways under the nom de guerre of Mr. Shea. No one else, it was argued, could have engineered an achievement of such magnitude without bungling and falling into the clutches of the police. Already wagers were being placed on the phantom's ability to evade capture until he should have consummated his plans. At ten o'clock, just as newsboys were raucously crying the latest extras, a taxicab stopped before a dingy establishment in a squalid and disreputable section of the Lower East Side. 
the gray phantom alighted hurriedly tossed the driver a bill then disappeared in a basement entrance the door was opened by a surly-looking man wearing a soiled apron and the phantom took a seat at one of the tables in the rear he looked nervously at his watch lieutenant culligore whom he had reached by telephone at police headquarters had promised to meet him at ten sharp and he had suggested lefty joe's place as a reasonably safe rendezvous the phantom cast a slanting glance at the rough-looking customers scattered about the place and just then the door opened and culligore walked in and took a seat beside him any luck inquired the lieutenant though the question seemed superfluous in view of the phantom's dejected appearance none that's why i wanted to talk with you how is fair speckle the lieutenant a little bleary-eyed and with a trace of diffidence in his manners looked queerly at the questioner why single out fair speckle he's in the same boat with the six others neither better nor worse though the doctors say his age and poor health will weigh against him you still think that fair speckle is mr shea culligore hesitated a thin inscrutable smile hovered above his lips if he is he gave himself a dose of his own medicine was his final comment and that's precisely what i think he did the phantom speaking in low tones gave the table a resounding thwack being one of the city's richest men he knew suspicion was apt to turn in his direction unless he was inoculated along with the others he is easily one of the seven wealthiest men in town and it would have looked queer if he had been omitted and so to ward off suspicion he had a dose of the poison injected into his own veins though i suppose the amount was carefully adjusted so it would produce the characteristic symptoms without causing death culligore appeared to ponder not bad reasoning he remarked that would be on a par with the trick he played on you yesterday fair speckle seems to be a shrewd old fox the kind that isn't overlooking any bets maybe you're right in that case of course the binding and gagging of the jap was a blind the phantom nodded well whoever mr shea is he certainly put one over last night was culligore's rueful comment he seems to have a gang of highly trained followers who do exactly as he tells them without batting an eyelid last night between ten o'clock and two in the morning he sent one or more of his men to the homes of each of the seven victims in two or three instances the servants were bribed i understand anyhow mr shea's men got in by some hook or crook four of the seven were caught in bed and trussed up before they could say jack robinson two of the others were tapped on the back of the head when they returned home from the theater and one got in a taxicab mr shea made a clean sweep what do the doctors say most of them are doing some fancy stalling to cover up what they don't know the high muckamucks of the profession are holding a consultation this morning to decide what's to be done one of them let slip the information that the symptoms look something like a combination of rabies and delirium tremens but he believes the disease is produced by one of the ancient poisons that were known to the asiatics the fact that the doctors are keeping mum is a bad sign it will be interesting to see how many of the patients will cough up mr shea's price for the antidote if all of them come across mr shea will rake in a good many millions billions rather i should say the phantom smiled wearily if successful the experiment will be unique in that it will demonstrate just how much a billionaire considers his life to be worth but that isn't what i wanted to talk with you about culligore i still think that fair speckle knows where miss hardwick can be found well 
Pelligore gazed noncommittally into space. "'I wonder if some sort of pressure couldn't be brought to bear on him to make him divulge what he knows. Last night he was in no condition to be questioned, and today I can hardly make a move without running the risk of being arrested.' "'I should say you can't,' declared Pelligore explosively. "'It's as much as my job is worth to be seen here talking with you. The Grey Phantom is a marked man, if ever there was one. Fairspeckle and the Jap swear you were in the apartment late last night, and Fairspeckle believes, or pretends to believe, which amounts to the same thing, that it was you who squirted the poison into his veins. Of course, he doesn't pretend to know just how it happened, but he remembers seeing you just as he was recovering his senses. You'd better take my advice and lie low for a while. I'll see what I can do with Fairspeckle, though I haven't any high hopes. I'll have him watched, and it's just possible that we can squeeze some information out of him. But look here, aren't you starting this thing from the wrong end? The Phantom gave him a puzzled glance. "'When Miss Hardwick left the Thelma Theatre day before yesterday,' pursued Culligore, "'I could have sworn she was on her way to see you. She didn't say anything about her plans, but that was the idea I got from her actions.' The Phantom shook his head. "'If she started from my place, she never got there. I called up on the long distance this morning and was told that nothing has been seen of her. Of course, something may have happened to her on the way. Well, I wouldn't worry just yet. The young lady has a lot of spunk, and I'll bet a pair of pink socks she knows how to take care of herself. It mightn't be a bad idea to get in touch with her father. He may have had some news from her since yesterday. I must be on my way. Mr. Shea is putting gray hairs on my head. Culligore rose, and the two men shook hands. They parted after the lieutenant had once more admonished the phantom against exposing himself to arrest. For a moment or two after the detective had left the place, the phantom looked dubiously at the door through which he had departed. "'There's something queer about Culligore, he mumbled. I wonder if he... He did not finish the thought, but with a shrug of the shoulders he stepped out and looked warily up and down the sidewalk. Culligore's warning had not been needed to impress upon him that caution was necessary. He sniffed danger in the very air he breathed as he slunk across the street, walked a block to the east, then ducked into a deserted doorway. A taxicab appeared, and he signaled the driver. For a moment he hesitated as to his next move, then Culligore's parting advice occurred to him, and, after consulting the small notebook he carried, he gave the chauffeur the address of the Hardwick residence. The cab started. The phantom glanced sharply through the windows. A familiar and yet intangible sensation had been with him constantly for the past hour. Now and then, at long intervals, he had had a fleeting impression that he was being watched. Now, as the cab chugged its way down the avenue, a sixth sense told him he was being followed, yet he could detect no sign of pursuit in the welter of traffic. He tried to dismiss the impression knowing that in his present state of high mental tension his senses were not to be trusted. He alighted in front of a modest brownstone house, its rigid exterior relieved by sprawling vines and flowers in the window boxes. The female servant who opened the door announced that Mr. Hardwick was at home, and the phantom gently pushed past her. In the room he entered, a thin, stoop-shouldered man was pacing back and forth with hands clasped at his back. He stopped abruptly at sight of the phantom and peered blankly into the visitor's face. "'You know me?' inquired the phantom. "'It's—it can't be—the gray phantom?' A startled look appeared in Mr. Hardwick's deeply furrowed face. 
he came a few steps nearer. "'But you are the gray phantom, I see. I recognize you from your photographs. Where is my daughter?' The phantom was a trifle taken aback by the sharply spoken question. "'Then you have received no word from her? I telephoned your house shortly after my arrival in the city and was told she had been missing for twenty-four hours. I was in hopes that you might have heard from her this morning. That's why I called.' "'I have not seen my daughter since breakfast, day before yesterday.' explained Mr. Hardwick in quavering tones. In the afternoon I received a brief message from her announcing she did not expect to be home for dinner and telling me not to worry. She is an impetuous child, and it isn't the first time she has caused me anxiety. Her message made me very uneasy, for she had been acting strangely ever since, since... Since the affair at the Thelma Theater? guessed the phantom. Listen, Mr. Hardwick, I am as deeply concerned in what has happened to her as you can possibly be. I intend to find her, no matter where she may be. Can you trust me? Mr. Hardwick's dim eyes searched the phantom's face for a long time. At first there was a look of doubt and suspicion in the old man's countenance, but it faded gradually away. "'I believe I can,' he declared. "'I know what your past has been, and I confess I have disapproved strongly of the friendship between you and my daughter. She is still impressionable, and there are romantic notions in her head, and you will forgive me if I say that you did not seem quite the proper person for her to associate with.' "'I can understand that,' murmured the phantom. Your attitude was quite natural in view of the circumstances. And so, continued Mr. Hardwick, when your letters came, I did not feel justified in giving them to her. I was not unappreciative of what you had done for her and me, but I feared she might form an unsuitable attachment. In short, I destroyed the letters after a glance at the handwriting on the envelope. The phantom smiled faintly. "'I know you acted for what you thought your daughter's best interests. It is not for me to criticize your conduct in the matter. I can readily see—but wait!' The phantom's brow suddenly clouded. "'How many letters did you intercept?' "'I think there were two. One came in the spring, the other late in the summer.' Yes, I am quite sure there were only two. The phantom's narrowing gaze swept the older man's face. His lips tightened into a grim line. The letter I mailed in the spring was the one in which I told your daughter of my removal from Azure Crest to Sea Glimpse, he explained in tense tones. I had promised to keep her informed of my movements so that she could communicate with me if she should ever need me. He paused for a moment. "'Have you any idea where your daughter might have gone? Didn't she say anything that suggested what her plans were?' "'She talked rather incoherently at breakfast, but said nothing about intending to go away. When I received her message later in the day, it occurred to me that she might have gone in search of you. You had been mentioned several times in our talks together, and I thought that if her intention was to find me, she probably went to the wrong place, gravely interrupted the phantom. Not knowing of my removal to see Glimpse, she naturally would look for me at Azure Crest. I sold the place through a broker and never even learned the name of the present owner. But her going to Azure Crest doesn't explain her absence for the past twenty-four hours. She would naturally return at once upon learning that I was not there. The trip by train takes only two or three hours. I fear something must have happened to her on the way. Well, we shall soon learn. He dashed across the room, snatched up the telephone from its stand in a corner, and, after being connected with the long-distance operator, 
gave his old number at Azurecrest. A wait followed. The phantom stood tense and rigid, while Mr. Hardwick dazedly drew his palm across his forehead. He gazed expectantly at the phantom while the latter spoke briefly into the transmitter. Finally, with a puzzled look in his face, the phantom hung up. "'The present owner of Azure Crest is a Mr. Slade,' he announced. "'I just had him on the wire. He tells me nothing has been seen of Miss Hardwick or of any person resembling her.' Mr. Hardwick looked as if he did not quite know whether to feel relieved or discouraged. The phantom grasped his hand. "'Don't worry,' he said in a tone of hopefulness which was far from feeling. "'We will find your daughter. I shall communicate with you as soon as I learn something.' He squeezed the older man's hand and walked out. Though he could not understand why, his interview with Hardwick and his brief talk with Slade had intensified his fears and misgivings. It seemed as though the mystery of Helen's disappearance had become darker and deeper. Suddenly, as he stood irresolute on the doorstep, he heard someone call his name. A limousine had silently drawn up at the curb, its sides of burnt sienna flashing brilliantly in the sunlight, and at the window, beckoning him with a smile and a nod, he saw a woman's face. He stepped forward, and the woman leaned slightly from the window. "'If you will step in,' she whispered, "'you may learn something of interest concerning the young person you are looking for.' The door opened invitingly. The words had exerted a magical effect on the phantom, and without a moment's hesitation he entered. As the car glided away, he noticed that the woman had a young, dark face, a figure almost serpentine in its slenderness, and that there was an air of gay insouciance about her smartly embroidered frock and rakish picture hat that seemed to clash with the subtlety and craftiness expressed by her pale green eyes. "'You are very reckless, my dear phantom,' she murmured. Please don't ask to what happy circumstance you owe the invitation to ride with me. I abhor ceremonious speeches. I am Fay Dale, though that probably don't interest you, and I have a message for you from Mr. Shea. The bluntness of the statement made the phantom catch his breath. He wondered whether it was the vivacious eyes of Fay Dale that had been following him all morning and giving him the haunting impression of being watched. "'As I said, you are very reckless,' Miss Dale went on. "'Twice within the last two days you have been warned to abandon the course you are pursuing, and you have paid no heed whatever. There's such a thing as carrying audacity to a fault, you know. Doesn't the safety of a certain young lady mean anything to you at all?' "'Everything!' exclaimed the phantom impulsively. "'You said you had something to tell me about her.' "'I have, but you mustn't be impatient. I have something very important to tell you. You have seen fit to meddle in an affair that doesn't concern you in the least. You have been warned that your conduct is endangering the life of the young lady, but evidently you have not taken the warning seriously.' I can assure you that Mr. Shea never makes idle threats. It is his wish that you leave New York at once." A taunting laugh was on the phantom's lips, but he held it back. "'Why?' he demanded. "'Because Mr. Shea doesn't care to have you interfere with him. He is now engaged in the most important enterprise of his life and he would rather not be opposed by such a formidable enemy as yourself. I shall be perfectly frank with you, even at the risk of inflating your vanity. You are the only man of whom Mr. Shea stands in fear. He has a profound respect for your genius. He laughs at the police and snaps his fingers at public opinion, but he knows the gray phantom is a dangerous adversary. 
At this particular time he can brook no opposition. That's why he requests you to leave New York immediately. I am flattered, murmured the phantom, gazing reflectively out of the car window. What I cannot understand is how Mr. Shea learned of my plans. Miss Dale gave an amused laugh. One of Mr. Shea's agents saw you in the Times Square the morning you arrived. You have been watched ever since. Mr. Shea has sources of information that would amaze you if I were to tell you about them. And he is just as resourceful in other ways. Don't you think you had better swallow your pride and comply with his wishes? Suppose I were to refuse. The phantom temporized, trying hard to restrain his impatience. Miss Dale looked straight into his eyes. There was a hint of cruelty in her tightly compressed lips. "'There are ways of breaking even such a stubborn will as yours,' she coldly declared. "'The young lady is absolutely in Mr. Shea's power. That gives him a means of persuasion that ought to impress even you. Nothing in the world can save her if you disobey his wishes.' Her tones carried an emphasis that caused the phantom to give her a sharp glance. There was a curl to her lips and a gleam in her eyes that impressed him even more strongly than her words. His mind worked quickly. "'If Mr. Shea will return Miss Hardwick safely to her home, I will leave New York on the next train,' he promised. She laughed frigidly. You must think Mr. Shea is a fool. He would lose his hold over you the moment he released Miss Hardwick, and what guarantee would he have that you would carry out your promise? My word of honor. It would be enough under ordinary circumstances, but not in this case. Evidently you do not realize the gravity of Miss Hardwick's position, or you would not quarrel with Mr. Shea's terms. She shrugged her slight shoulders. "'Well, you shall soon be convinced that Mr. Shea is not to be trifled with. From Miss Hardwick's own lips you shall learn what a desperate predicament she is in. After that, my dear Phantom, I think you will be more amenable to reason.' There was a question on the Phantom's tongue, but just then the car drew up in front of an apartment house facing Central Park and Miss Dale conducted him through an ornate entrance, then up three flights in the elevator, and a little gasp of admiration escaped the phantom as they passed into an exquisitely furnished apartment. Save for the prevalence of the feminine touch, exemplified in gorgeous but meaningless trifles and goo it met the emphatic approval of the phantom's discriminating eye. Miss Dale excused herself, and entered an adjoining room, and he was left alone for a few minutes. He strained his ears and listened. From faint sounds coming through the closed door, he imagined she was at the telephone. The cold gleam in her eyes, as he had helped her from the car, was still haunting him, and he wondered what she had meant when she promised that from Helen's own lips should he learn the nature of her predicament. The frigid, insinuating smile was still on her lips when she returned to the room in which she had left him. "'Your curiosity shall be gratified in a few moments,' she announced, seating herself and regarding him with a cold, impersonal gaze. There was an air of quiet self-reliance and efficiency about her that enabled him to understand how she could be a valuable assistant to Mr. Shea. Neither spoke, and presently the silence was interrupted by the ringing of the telephone in the other room. "'Answer, please,' she said lightly, the faintest trace of malignant satisfaction in her tones. "'I think Miss Hardwick is on the wire.' Puzzled and tormented by vague suspicions, the phantom passed to the telephone. The woman followed a short distance behind. "'Hello,' he said tensely. He started violently as he recognized the answering voice. 
he would have known it among a million voices despite the hysterical catch and the staccato accents that tended to disguise it it spoke a few jumbled and disconnected phrases then broke into a stream of loud and wild laughing in which he detected the same note of maniacal glee that had characterized the ghastly laughter of w rufus fairspeckle chapter fourteen the elusive mr shea spasmodically the gray phantom pressed the receiver closer to his ear the laughter at the other end of the wire rose to a shrill crescendo then ended abruptly in a harsh and discordant twang helen shouted the phantom no answer came nothing but a muffled thud that sounded as if the person at the other end had suddenly dropped the receiver his face white the phantom turned to miss dale are you convinced now she murmured a silken smile hovering about her lips and don't you think you had better obey mr shay's wishes and leave the city immediately the phantom mopped the clammy perspiration from his forehead a moment ago his face had been distorted from horror now a look of rage glittered menacingly in his eyes mr shay will pay for this he muttered thickly when i have finished with him he will wish he had never been born and just what do you propose to do miss dale airily waved her slim white hand as a measure of self-protection knowing that he could not control you by any other means mr shea has caused miss hardwick to be inoculated with the same malady that killed miss darrow and which will kill seven of the city's wealthiest men unless they comply with his wishes there is only one thing which can save her and that is the antidote it is in the possession of a malayan scientist one of mr shay's most devoted followers and it will be administered only when you have carried out the terms i have explained to you the phantom stood silent while trying to fight down the urge of emotions that threatened to swamp his reason suddenly his roving gaze was fixed on the numbered tag above the mouthpiece of the telephone instrument his lids contracted a little brilliant idea my dear phantom drawled miss dale for once you are quite transparent it is your intention as soon as you leave my apartment to call up the telephone exchange and trace the call thus learning miss hardwick's whereabouts it would be simple for it was a long distance connection and such calls are always recorded i will save you the trouble however miss hardwick is at azure crest azure crest echoed the phantom momentarily a trifle dazed miss dale seemed to find his perplexity highly amusing when mr shea learned the place was for sale he bought it anonymously through an agent it seemed an ideal spot for certain experiments he had in mind hoping to find you there miss hardwick went to azure crest the day after miss darrow's death and for diverse reasons it was thought best to detain her the phantom muttered an exclamation slade had lied to him then when the phantom had called up azure crest earlier in the day and inquired for miss hardwick slade he now suspected was one of mr shay's agents and under the circumstances it was not surprising that he had disclaimed all knowledge of helen the phantom might not have accepted his denial so readily if he had had the faintest inkling that mr shay was the present owner of his former retreat suddenly he whirled round on his heels and started abruptly from the room wait a moment commanded miss dale as he reached the door and a subtle quality in her tone caused him to stop how impulsive you are my dear phantom i suppose you mean to rush madly off to azure crest and rescue the fair damsel stop and think for a moment surely you don't imagine i would have told you miss hardwick's whereabouts 
unless I had been absolutely certain that you were powerless to act. The phantom saw the weight of the argument at once. He moved away from the door. "'Glad you are willing to listen to reason,' murmured Miss Dale. "'You see, you could accomplish nothing at all by going to Azurecrest alone. The place is very carefully guarded by a little army of picked men, not to mention a few savage dogs. Of course, you might ask the police for assistance, supposing that you were on good terms with them, but what would be the result? If Mr. Shea and his followers are put in jail, Miss Hardwick will die, and so will the seven others. In fact, if anything at all happens to Mr. Shea and the members of his organization, the antidote will be irrevocably lost. I believe you grasp the idea, don't you? The phantom's expression showed that he did. There was a baffled look in his eye that testified to his thorough appreciation of Mr. Shea's ingenious precautions. "'In other words,' Miss Dale went on, her tones now soft and purring, "'you have the best reasons in the world for not wishing the police to annoy Mr. Shea. In a way, Mr. Shea has compelled you to become an ally of his, as a result of having Miss Hardwick in his power.' It is really an excellent arrangement, and the police, when they understand the situation, will not be inclined to risk the lives of the seven wealthy men by forcing Mr. Shea to take extreme measures. Ah, you are beginning to understand, at last, that Mr. Shea is practically invulnerable. So it would seem, mumbled the phantom, at last finding his voice. And don't you think you had better be reasonable and accept Mr. Shea's conditions? If you decide to be sensible, the antidote will be administered to Miss Hardwick as soon as Mr. Shea's plans are consummated, and she will not be one whit the worse off for her experience. On the other hand, if you choose to be disagreeable— Miss Dale paused significantly. The phantom's tense face bespoke a great mental effort. One by one he reviewed the details of Mr. Shea's brilliant precautions. He could not see a loophole anywhere. As far as his imagination could stretch, the only result of obstinacy would be certain death for Helen. Yet the cup of defeat was a bitter draught. Never before had the gray phantom surrendered to any man, but now the life of one dear to him was in danger. He made his decision promptly. "'Mr. Shea wins,' he announced with a bow. Then he walked out, oblivious of the triumphant smile that curled Miss Dale's lips. His brow was clouded as he descended in the elevator and walked out on the sidewalk. He was aware that the dragnet was thrown out and that he was endangering his liberty by going about so boldly, but arrest and imprisonment seemed a minor matter now. For the first time in his life he was a defeated man. Worse still, he could not rid himself of fears concerning Helen's safety. Presently he paused as a new and even more disturbing thought flashed through his mind. He had accepted Mr. Shea's terms in the hope that by doing so he would ensure Helen's safety. He wondered if he had been too gullible, and he dodged into a doorway while considering the question. He had been under a terrific tension the past few days, and his mind had not been working with its customary agility. Now it occurred to him that he had nothing but Miss Dale's word for it that Helen's life would be spared if he yielded to Mr. Shea's terms. He had relied on her promise, not because of blind faith in her, but rather because Mr. Shea would gain nothing by killing Helen. He was merely using her as a means of suasion, whereby to hold the phantom in leash and prevent interference with his plans, and once she had served his purpose, there was no reason why he should do her harm. 
but the phantom was far from satisfied at azure crest helen must have heard and seen things that if divulged would constitute a great danger to mr shea and his organization her keen perceptions and inquisitive nature were always delving into whatever was strange and mysterious would mr shea dare let her live after her usefulness to him was past again as he repeatedly asked himself the question a cold perspiration broke out on the phantom's brow once more he made a quick decision completely reversing the one he had made in miss dale's presence he glanced quickly at his watch if he remembered correctly there would be a train for azure crest inside twenty minutes single-handed relying only on his quick wits and agile strength he would beard the lion in his den but first he was anxious to learn whether Culligore had made any progress toward clearing up the other phases of the mystery, particularly in regard to Mr. Fairspeckle. He entered a convenient telephone booth and called up the police department. Luck was with him, for after a brief delay he heard Culligore's voice over the wire. "'Oh, Fairspeckle, why, he's vamoosed.' slipped away right from under the eyes of a doctor and a nurse can you beat it the phantom's veins tingled as he hung up fair speckle's disappearance was final proof that he had correctly guessed the identity of mr shea chapter fifteen dr tagala helen's little wrist watch showed a quarter past four Getting up from the chair, she roamed aimlessly about the room. Presently she stopped at the table and gazed down. The initials she had heedlessly scrawled in the dust were still there. The faint tracings that had betrayed her knowledge of Mr. Shea's identity seemed fraught with fate now. With a few idle strokes of the hand she had signed her own death warrant. She could not have mistaken the sinister gleam she had seen in Slade's eyes as he looked down at the letters in the dust. His eyes had spelled her doom just as surely as the tracings on the table spelled the name by which Mr. Shea was known to the world at large. And the slam with which he had closed the door told even more eloquently than words that her life was forfeit. Suddenly she felt a little hysterical. The fatal secret she had learned, the spectacular intrigues of Mr. Shea, even the scrawl in the dust, seemed so trivial now that she felt an impulse to laugh. It was grotesque, she thought, that such a little thing as a couple of initials traced on the surface of a table should mean the blotting out of her life. The house was very silent. No one had entered the room since Slade's departure and she had spent the intervening hours in a state of musing detachment. Her thoughts and fancies flitted about in circles, and she had a curious impression that only her mind was functioning and that her emotions were numb. The slanting rays of the sun glimmered pleasantly on the furniture, and she wondered abstractly whether she should ever see the sunlight of another day. She glanced down at her dress, trimmed with delicate touches of red, and the thought struck her that perhaps she was wearing it for the last time. It was odd, she mused, that the prospect held no terror for her, and that her only feeling was a sense of dull, aching void. Voices in the hall outside started her out of her reverie. The gray phantom's name, spoken in excited tones, sent an emotional quiver through her being and awoke her from her lethargy. Sensations, gentle and stimulating ones, stirred in the depths of her consciousness. "'The gray phantom,' she whispered, looking pensively at the door. He had inspired her with emotions that she had never been quite able to understand. At times they had terrified her by their strangeness and power, 
for she had felt as if they were rousing new impulses within her and sweeping her along toward an unknown destiny. His career, bright and swift as the flash of a meteor, had intrigued her imagination even while she felt awed and a little frightened at the stories she heard about him. Of late he had tried to throw off the shackles of the past and start a new life, and she had watched his efforts with a strange and bewildering sense of sponsorship. The voices in the hall had ceased now, but the name that had been spoken was still echoing in her ears and vibrating against hidden chords in her consciousness. Of a sudden the prospect of death, which a few minutes before she had contemplated without fear, filled her with dread and poignant regrets. The mere mention of a name had inspired in her a vehement desire to live. She tiptoed to the door. It did not surprise her that Slade had left it unlocked. The picket fence, the ferocious Caesar, and the attendants made such a precaution unnecessary. She stepped out in the hall, then looked hesitantly about her, but she could see nothing of the men whose voices she had heard a few moments ago. At the end of the hall a door stood open, and she moved silently in that direction. Entering, she ran her eyes over long white benches on which were bottles, jars, and queer-looking apparatus. There was a reek of chemicals in the air, and she guessed it was a laboratory of some sort. It all seemed a little strange to her, but in the next moment her attention was engaged by voices coming through a partly open door at one side of the large room. "'Oh, it's serious enough,' one of them was saying, and she instantly knew that the speaker was Slade. "'The Grey Phantom is the only man alive who can queer Mr. Shea's game.' The words were spoken in a tone of reluctant respect that gave Helen a thrill. Coming from an enemy, it was a striking tribute to the Phantom's genius and power. "'Ah, the Grey Phantom! I have heard the name. One of your fascinating master criminals, is he not?" The second man spoke with the exaggerated precision that characterizes the educated foreigner. "'But why does the Grey Phantom interfere in the affairs of Mr. Shea?' Slade chuckled grimly. "'That's hard to tell, Dr. Tagala. Perhaps for a number of reasons. Maybe he dislikes to see another man excel him at his own game. There's such a thing as professional jealousy, even among crooks, you know. All we know for certain is that he arrived in New York City the day Mr. Shea's notices were posted. One of our men saw him, and he was watched almost from the moment of his arrival. His actions indicated plainly that he had gone on the warpath against Mr. Shea. Confound the infernal meddler! "'But Mr. Shea is a resourceful man,' observed Dr. Tagala. "'He surely can devise some means whereby this impudent fellow may be restrained.' "'He has already done so. As you know, he motored back to New York early this morning, but I had a long-distance telephone conversation with him a few minutes ago. He made a very good suggestion, but the execution of it will have to be left to you.' To me? You remember hearing me speak of the young lady who came here looking for the gray phantom? Her name is Helen Hardwick, and she is much too astute for her own good. She's learned a number of things that won't bear repeating, and among them is the identity of Mr. Shea. Of course, as soon as I found out how much she knew, I saw that she would have to be put out of the way and I told Mr. Shea so over the telephone. He overruled my plan, or rather he suggested an improvement. What was it? To let the young lady remain on earth five or six days longer, in other words, until Mr. Shea has cashed in his chips. You see, doctor, the gray phantom has quite a crush on the young lady, 
and he would rather go through hell-fire than have a single hair on her head hurt. Helen felt the blood rushing to her head. "'I am beginning to comprehend,' remarked Dr. Tagala. "'It is Mr. Shea's plan to keep the gray phantom in check by threatening to inflict harm on the young lady. An excellent idea, but a trifle vague.' "'Oh, there's nothing vague about it, and it involves something far more substantial than mere threats. Can you guess, doctor?' There came an interval of silence. Evidently Dr. Tagala was exercising his imagination. Helen crept a little closer, then peered through the narrow crack between the door and the jam. Only two or three feet from her, with his lips curled into a leer, sat Slade. Her eyes traveled a little farther until she saw Dr. Tagala, and suddenly she caught her breath. It required all her self-control to keep from betraying her presence. She had seen the face twice before, first in the Thelma Theater, and later at the window of the room in which Slade had interviewed her shortly after her arrival at Azure Crest, and on each occasion the sight had given her a chill. The coarse and brutal features, framed by black hair that reached almost to the shoulders, stood out in sharp contrast to the man's cultured speech and polished manners. Again, as she saw the brutish lips and the flaming eyes, she received an impression of something evil and loathsome. She leaned weakly against the wall, and then she heard again Dr. Tagala's voice. "'I am very poor at making conjectures. You will have to enlighten me.' "'Well, then, Mr. Shea's orders are that you are to inoculate the young lady with the laughing fever. You will calculate the dose just as you did in the cases of the seven millionaires. The phantom will be told that the antidotes will be administered on the one condition that he goes back to his bailiwick and keeps his hands out of Mr. Shea's affairs. That will keep him on his good behavior for a week, and by that time Mr. Shea will have cleaned up. "'And the young lady?' Slade laughed unpleasantly. "'She knows too much, as I have already told you. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Much knowledge is apt to prove fatal. You will merely forget to administer the antidote when the time comes.' Dr. Tagala gave a rumbling laugh. Helen felt a sudden chill. She leaned weakly against the wall. Inoculation with what Slade had called the laughing fever seemed far more dreadful than death itself. "'By the way, doctor,' Slade went on, "'I hope the antidote is safely hidden.' "'You may rest assured on that point,' Tagala declared. I have hidden it so securely that not even Mr. Shea knows where to find it. Good. That being the case, our seven millionaire friends would be in a bad fix if a sudden misfortune should befall you. Nothing on earth could save them, said Tagala emphatically. The secret is in my exclusive possession. No other man could diagnose the malady, much less prescribe a remedy. The lives of the seven gentlemen are absolutely in my hand. Then there isn't the slightest chance of Mr. Shea's plans falling through? Not the slightest. The seven gentlemen will pay Mr. Shea's price, and within a week we shall all be rich beyond the dreams of avarice. The gloating tones hinted that Dr. Tagala's imagination was luxuriating in enchanting visions. "'By the way, when do we inoculate the young lady?' "'Better wait till evening,' suggested Slade. "'There will be less danger of interruption then.' Helen turned away. She feared an involuntary cry of horror would betray her if she remained longer. Steadying herself with great difficulty, she stole out of the laboratory and slipped back into her room. 
Her watch showed half past five, and the inoculation would probably not take place for an hour or two. In the meantime, she wanted to think and, if possible, find a way of escape, but the fierce pounding of the blood against her temples seemed to preclude clear thinking. Her only distinct thought was that she must flee from Azure Crest, no matter what dangers and difficulties she might encounter. She felt that the gray phantom would gladly fling his life away in order to protect her. But in this instance his hands were tied. He could not make a single move without rendering her predicament worse, and that fact would restrain him, much as he might rebel against his enforced inaction. Mr. Shea's men would point out to him that her safety depended on an unresisting attitude on his part. He could not know what she had just learned from the conversation between Slade and Tagala, that it was their intention to take her life anyway. Somehow, she told herself, she must manage to escape from the horrors awaiting her at Azure Crest. Even being clawed and torn by the savage dog seemed preferable to the slightest touch of Dr. Tagala's hand. She shuddered whenever her imagination conjured up a vision of his repelling features, and a hoarse cry rose in her throat at thought of being inoculated with the fearful malady. Miss Neville's maniacal outbursts were still ringing in his ears, and she remembered the hideous strains that had poured from the lips of the dying woman in the Thelma Theater. The recollections filled her with a sickening terror. With ghastly visions floating before her eyes, she rushed blindly from the room. The hall was deserted, and she scurried down the stairs as if pursued by a monster. She reached the other door without hindrance, and a flickering hope began to stir within her as she scanned the wide stretch of lawn surrounding the house. The long shadows cast by the trees gave her an additional sense of safety. Swiftly, without a backward glance, she started to run. Her hopes rose higher and higher as she plunged into the thick shadows among the trees. In a few moments now, if her flight remained unnoticed, she would have reached the fence. Somehow she would manage to scale it, or maybe she could find an opening somewhere. She quickened her pace but of a sudden a low, rumbling growl sent a chill through her veins. She stopped, stood crouching behind the scraggy trunk of a hemlock, and glanced wildly in all directions. With great leaps and skips, a huge black form was rushing toward her, its teeth gleaming ominously between slavering jaws. In a few moments it would be at her throat, and then— once more a vision of Dr. Tagala's repulsive features filled her with dread. Again she looked about her, then raced swiftly in the direction where the shadows were thickest. Behind her the underbrush crackled beneath the paws of the savage beast. In a moment or two he would be snapping at her heels. Again hope rose within her. A squatty shed loomed within a narrow clearing. With the strength of frenzy, she sped toward it. If she could reach it before the dog could overtake her, she would be temporarily safe. A great terror urged her on with the speed of the wind. Now the dog was snatching at the hem of her fluttering skirt, but she was already at the door. With a final exertion of strength, she pushed it open and rushed in, then slammed it shut behind her. With a deep breath of relief, she lurched against the wall. Suddenly she recoiled as from a blow. "'What are you doing here?' queried a gruff voice. She stared into the dusk around her. A few wisps of waning sunlight straggled in through a small window in the rear. Gradually, as her eyes grew accustomed to the dusk, she descried a stocky figure leaning over a shovel. It was the sour-faced individual who had opened the gate for her on her arrival at Azure Crest. 
little by little as her pupils responded to the dim light she took in each detail of the scene an amazed gasp slipped from her lips an oblong space had been torn up in the center of the flooring and on each side of it were little mounds of dirt instinctively she stepped closer and looked down into the rectangular hollow she had a weird sensation that she was looking into a grave and with a shudder she glanced up into the man's face what what's that she asked hoarsely indicating the hollow the man guffawed better not ask questions miss this is a nasty job and you better clear out he looked aside just then and she followed his glance in a corner of the shed she saw a heap vaguely resembling a human form her feet seemed to drag her forward in spite of her horror and she lifted the blanket that covered the figure then she stood rigid her tightly drawn lips stifling the cry that rose in her throat at once she recognized the features of miss neville the woman whose maniacal laughter had startled her the night she arrived at azure crest the face was white and rigid now but the wraith of a ghastly smile lingered on her lips a long shuddering moan escaped her and then she sank limply to the floor she had a weird sensation during the hours that followed that she was treading on the brink of oblivion a merciful mist seemed to obscure everything she was dimly aware of being carried from the shed and placed on a long white table through the haze that engulfed her she glimpsed the repulsive features of dr tagala she felt a sting in the arm and then a sickening substance raced through her veins for a time she felt as though unseen hands were wafting her body through a limitless void somewhere far away she thought there was laughter and she had a curious impression that it was coming from her own lips dawn came and a flood of sunlight brightened the void through which she was roaming the strange and wild fancies that had flitted around her throughout the night seemed to melt away and now she saw things more clearly she was standing at a telephone and over the wire came a voice that sounded strangely familiar words poured from her lips but they seemed futile and meaningless and then an involuntary contraction of laryngeal muscles filled the room with wild strains of laughter it frightened her and just then a hand jerked her away that'll do said a voice and she thought it was slade's the gray phantom has heard enough chapter sixteen checkmated a mass of jagged elongated clouds hovered like scowling specters over azure crest a raw wind sighed moodily among the birches and hemlocks as the gray phantom reached the apex of the hill stopping within fifty yards of the high picket fence he glanced toward the house that once had served him as a retreat and shelter against the activities of the police the white trimmings of doors and windows gleamed faintly in the dusk and here and there a light twinkled through the trees the phantom turned away and walked a few paces toward the fence on the trip from the city he had tried to exclude helen from his mind for each thought of her was maddening and he needed a cool brain and a steady nerve if he were to accomplish his purpose by sheer force of will he had tried to forget the hysterical laughter he had heard over the wire and which had told him with grim eloquence what had happened to her to keep disturbing thoughts from his mind he had outlined several plans of procedure and prepared himself for the difficult and perilous task that awaited him after a brief search over the rugged ground he stopped at the side of a huge boulder and cleared away an accumulation of dry twigs dead branches and rotting weeds 
after the obstruction had been removed an opening barely large enough to permit him to crawl through appeared at the base of the rock it slanted gently into the ground then widened into a tunnel in which he was able to walk upright during his sojourn at azure crest it had often occurred to him that an emergency exit might some day prove desirable and he had built the tunnel in consequence he had not happened to mention the existence of the passage when he sold the place and he did not think it likely that the new owner had discovered it though he had never had occasion to use it during his occupancy it now gave him a distinct advantage in that it enabled him to enter the house secretly and by an easy route reaching the farther end of the tunnel he fumbled along the wall until he found a spring deftly hidden in a crevice evidently the mechanism was still in good working order for a door swung squeakily on unoiled hinges he passed inside touched another spring and the door swung shut in another moment he had switched on an electric light the room was narrow and almost square and there were neither windows nor visible doors it was supplied with air through ingeniously hidden ventilators and the phantom had fitted it up for brief occupancy occasionally it had suited his mood to retire to the hidden chamber and read one of his favorite books throwing off the light overcoat he had been wearing he then examined his automatic and the little pocket case in which he carried a number of carefully selected tools that had stood him in good stead in numerous emergencies despite the advantages afforded him by the tunnel and the secret room he would be surrounded by dangers at every step he had no doubt mr shay's henchman would kill him on sight and he could not afford to toss his life away recklessly while helen was in danger he glanced at his watch it was only a little after ten and sounds reaching him through the ventilator shaft warned him that the occupants of the house were still about as soon as the house had quieted down a little he would try the first plan of his program if that failed he was holding two or three others in reserve for half an hour he waited then a sliding panel opened at his touch on a spring and he ascended a narrow spiral stairway that terminated in what appeared to be a blank wall his hand touched a lever and the phantom passed through an aperture that instantly closed behind him he was standing in a dark room in a seldom frequented part of the house he advanced a few steps then stood still listening someone was laughing and in the darkness the sounds impressed him even more forcibly than they had in the light of day he walked on trying desperately to exclude the agonizing accents from his ears hurriedly he opened a door then as quickly drew it to again someone was passing in the hall outside he waited till the footsteps moved away then looked warily out a tall figure walking with a brisk swinging gait was turning into one of the rooms farther down the corridor as soon as the door had closed behind him the phantom followed on tiptoe noticing that the hall was deserted he bent his ear to the keyhole two voices one of them speaking with a distinct foreign accent were talking in tones signifying that they had reason to be well pleased with themselves they were discussing the progress of mr shay's adventure and congratulating themselves on the prospect of becoming immensely rich within a few days the phantom listening intently was learning several facts of interest the two speakers were addressing each other as dr tagala and mr slade and he gathered from diverse remarks that the latter was in charge of affairs at azure crest while mr shea was watching developments in new york dr tagala seemed to be the scientist who had discovered the poison that was the chief factor in mr shea's scheme having absorbed a great deal of useful information the phantom raised his head from the keyhole then he flexed his muscles and drew the automatic from his pocket 
here was his opportunity for putting his first plan to the test. It was cruder than the alternative ones, but it might also prove vastly more effective. His hand closed around the knob. With automatic in one hand, he softly pushed the door open, entering so silently that for several moments neither of the two men in the room was aware of the intrusion. He gazed for an instant at the singularly repulsive face of the man addressed as Dr. Tagala, then gave his companion a fleeting glance of inspection, noticing that Slade had the strong jaw and aggressiveness of manners that usually go with domineering personality. Only the eyes, shifty and unmagnetic, gave him a suspicion that there was a weak strain in the man's moral fiber. Smiling affably, with every nerve in his body a tingle, he advanced to the table. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' he said softly. With a hoarse cry, Slade sprang from his chair, but Dr. Tagala gave the intruder only a cold, impersonal glance. "'Sit down, Slade,' ordered the phantom, "'and both of you keep your hands on the table.' He made a significant gesture with the automatic. Slade stared and looked as if not quite certain that his eyes were to be trusted. "'How the devil did you get in?' he exclaimed explosively. He tried hard to get a grip on himself, but the twitching of the lines around his mouth showed that he was ill at ease. "'But then,' he added, steadying his voice with an effort, I suppose anything is possible for the gray phantom. Ah, so you are the gray phantom. Dr. Tagala seemed mildly impressed. I have heard a great deal of you, and I have felt some curiosity in regard to you. I must confess to a great disappointment, however. I did not think a man of your genius would descend to such crude methods. Of you I had expected subtlety and finesse. Bah! Slade was rapidly regaining his self-control, but he kept his hands obediently on the table. From time to time he cast an uneasy glance into the muzzle of the phantom's pistol. I can't imagine how you got in, he admitted. How you got past the picket fence, the dogs, and the watchmen is too much for me. But, now that you are here, what do you intend to do? I suppose it has something to do with Miss Hardwick? Precisely, Slade. The other sneered. Don't you realize that there's nothing you can do? What you heard over the telephone wire should have warned you to keep hands off. Miss Hardwick's life is absolutely in our power. For the present, yes but I think the situation will soon be reversed. How? The phantom's lids contracted and his eyes held a steely glitter as he looked down at the man in the chair. Then he cast a quick glance over his shoulder. At any moment someone was apt to enter and deprive him of his advantage. I intend to fight the devil with fire, he announced. In other words, I am going to fight your Mr. Shea with his own weapons. Mr. Shea works through fear. He hopes to induce his seven victims to surrender half of their fortunes to him by putting the fear of death into them. Now it's a poor rule that doesn't work both ways. Suppose you come to the point, suggested Slade sneeringly. Very well. I understand that you, Slade, are in charge here during Mr. Shea's absence. I want you to do two things at once. One of them is to release Miss Hardwick immediately. The other, to have the antidote administered to her. Slade's eyes left the automatic and gave the phantom an insolent glance. A bit dictatorial, aren't you? Has it occurred to you that I might refuse? Certainly. The phantom smiled, but his eyes were hard as steel. Mr. Shea has probably considered the possibility that his seven victims may refuse to accept his terms, 
but he feels fairly sure that in the end they will submit. His whole scheme is based on the idea that a man will do almost anything to escape death. So will you, Slade, especially when I convince you that you will never leave this room alive unless you do as I say. Slade shifted uneasily in his chair. A tinge of gray was slowly creeping into his face. Make no mistake, Slade, the phantom went on. It's true there are no blood stains on my hands, but this time I am gambling for higher stakes than ever before in my life. I could kill you without the slightest scruple. His eyes, as he looked down at the other man, were keen as rapiers. He spoke each word with an emphasis that spelled terrible earnestness. Slade winced and writhed beneath his lowering gaze. "'What what do you want me to do?' he stammered. The phantom felt a thrill as he saw that the other was yielding. He had judged him correctly at first glance. Slade, despite his swaggers and blustering, was at heart a coward. "'In the first place you are to instruct Dr. Tagala to administer the antidote to Miss Hardwick immediately. I will give you exactly sixty seconds. If you have not obeyed by that time, you will be a dead man." To emphasize the threat, the phantom took out his watch. Slade turned a quavering glance on the scientist. He opened his lips to speak, but Dr. Tagala anticipated him. I dislike to interrupt such a dramatic scene, he declared in drawling tones edged with a faint trace of sarcasm. But it has proceeded far enough. You see, my dear gray phantom, that even if Mr. Slade should give me such absurd instructions as you request, I would refuse to comply with them. Furthermore, in order to save you needless waste of energy, let me inform you that the antidote is concealed in a place where I alone know where to find it. We are protected against every conceivable emergency." The phantom felt a presentment of defeat, but his face, tense and threatening, showed not the slightest sign of it. With a quick movement he turned the pistol from Slade and pointed the muzzle straight at Dr. Tagala's head. "'All right, doctor,' he said crisply. "'In that case, let me warn you that I could kill you with just as little scruple as I could Slade.' But the scientist only folded his arms and smiled. A look of patient amusement crossed his swarthy and evil face. "'That is an excellent example of what you Americans call bluff,' he drawled. "'You can't frighten me.' for I know you have not the slightest intention to kill me. If you take my life, the antidote will never be found, and then the charming young lady will die. Mr. Shea anticipated just such a situation as this when he made me the sole custodian of the antidote. A trace of disappointment passed over the phantom's face. A sense of bafflement took hold of him as he realized that Thanks to Mr. Shea's ingenious precautions, his first plan had failed disastrously. Still pointing the pistol, he backed slowly toward the door. "'Mr. Shea wins this time,' he frankly acknowledged. "'But he will lose in the end. The gray phantom was never beaten yet. I wish you good night, gentlemen.' With that he was out of the door and running swiftly down the hall. With a cry of rage, Slade sprang from the chair and started in pursuit, blowing a pocket whistle as he ran. Men appeared from every direction, and Slade shouted orders that the house and grounds be thoroughly searched at once. The men scattered, and in a few moments the search was on. But the gray phantom, safe in his hidden chamber, was already at work on the details of his next move. Chapter 17 Dr. Tagala's Discovery A glance at his watch as he entered the secret room 
showed the phantom that daybreak was not far away. In a little while it would be highly unsafe for him to walk about the house. Besides, the execution of his next move depended for its success on darkness and quiet. To jeopardize his project by a reckless move would be the height of folly and might result in disastrous consequences. Much as his fears and anxiety urged him to immediate action, the phantom decided to wait till the following night. He lay down on the cot and slept by snatches. Now and then, as a faint but terrifying sound came down the ventilator shaft, he awoke with a start. Peals of unnatural laughter, sounding remotely in the darkness of the hidden chamber, started a cold sweat on his forehead. By sheer physical force he would shut out the sounds, knowing that for the present he could do nothing, but the mutterings that fell from his lips and the convulsive clenching of his hands boded no good for Mr. Shea and his followers. Morning came, and he tried to fix his mind on his forthcoming move. A grim look came into his face as he contemplated the step he was about to take. Ordinarily he would have shrunk from it in disgust, for it was an expedient he had never employed in the past. Now, however, with the life of Helen Hardwick in danger, he must employ whatever means might prove effective. It was no time for niceties or scruples. Besides, there was no reason why he should be restrained by ethical considerations when dealing with blackguards like Mr. Shea and his retainers. The hours dragged. A troubled look on his face, the phantom paced the floor of the narrow chamber. His plans for the night were complete except for one detail. Cudgel his brain as he might, there was one small but important matter that continued to puzzle him. Evening came, and the solution of the difficulty still eluded him. He was a little faint from hunger, for he had not eaten for twenty-four hours, and he wondered if his brain would not work better after a visit to the pantry. In a little while the house would quiet down for the night, and then he could safely leave his hiding place. At last he was ready for action. He gave his automatic a careful inspection. Into his pocket he put a coil of thin but strong rope which he had unearthed from an old chest. Then he turned off the light and ascended the spiral stairway. After listening in vain for sounds, he tiptoed out in the hallway, then down the main stairway. The entire house seemed immersed in sleep, and even the strained laughter had stopped for a time. Evidently the occupants of the house, never guessing that he was hiding in their very midst, supposed that the gray phantom had left Azure Crest. He felt more alert after gratifying his hunger in the well-stocked pantry. By the back stairway he returned to the second floor. Silent as a shadow, he walked down the hall, pausing briefly before every door and listening. It was important that he should locate Dr. Tagala's room, for his whole plan revolved around the scientist. Also, he was anxious to take the doctor completely by surprise. At one of the doors he stopped longer than before the others. A faint reek of chemicals filtered through the keyhole, and in a vague sense the odor suggested Dr. Tagala's nearness. Neither light nor sound came through the tiny opening, so evidently there was no one in the room. The door was locked, but a simple operation with one of the tools in his case opened it readily, and he stepped inside. He peered sharply into the darkness before he thought it safe to snap on his electric flashlight. As the small point of light played over floor and walls, he knew at once that the room was a chemical laboratory. Chemistry had always held a strong fascination for him, and his knowledge of the science was far more comprehensive than the average layman's. Something prompted him to glance twice at the long rows of bottles stacked on shelves around the room. Stepping closer, he read some of the labels, and suddenly he gave a faint chuckle of elation. 
the problem that had puzzled him all day was at last solved. From its place on the shelf he took a small bottle containing a colorless fluid and slipped it into his pocket. The chemical was a very ordinary one, but he expected it to serve a highly useful purpose. Again he darted the electric gleam over the room. At one side was a door, and as he bent his ear to the keyhole, he heard sounds of deep and regular breathing. Something told him that the sleeper was Dr. Tagala, for it seemed only logical that the scientist should occupy the room adjoining the laboratory. Quickly extinguishing his flashlight, he turned the knob and noiselessly pushed the door open, then stepped softly in the direction whence the sounds of breathing came. Once more he brought his flashlight into play, but only to assure himself by a swift glance that the sleeper was Tagala. A faint, triumphant grin curled his lips, and then the flash disappeared in his pocket. For a moment, standing in utter darkness, he tensed his muscles for action. In an instant he pressed his knee firmly against the sleeper's chest and wound his fingers tightly around Tagala's throat. A harsh rumble sounded in the doctor's windpipe, but the firm clutch over his Adam's apple prevented an outcry. He writhed, squirmed, doubled up his knees, and attempted to fight with his arms, but the phantom gradually increased the pressure on his throat, and his struggle grew feebler and feebler. Finally, when he was nearly exhausted, the phantom took out a cloth with which he had provided himself before leaving the secret room and applied it as a gag. The doctor made only a feeble show of resistance while his arms and legs were bound, and finally the phantom took the limp form on his back and started from the room. Every inch of the way was beset with perils. A board creaking under the double weight of captor and captive might bring on a sudden attack, or one of the occupants of the house might be encountered in the hall. But luck was with the phantom, and in a short time he had placed his burden on the cot in the hidden chamber. Panting from the strenuous exercise, he removed the gag from his prisoner's mouth, then switched on the light. The doctor, breathing stertorously, his face almost black from the recent choking, wriggled his arms and legs in a futile effort to free himself. Seeing it was hopeless, he subsided and looked dazedly about him. His eyes opened wide as he saw the phantom. "'You again?' he exclaimed. The phantom smiled at sight of his stupefaction. "'You didn't suppose I would give up so easily, did you, doctor? "'You don't seem particularly pleased to see me. "'No doubt you thought I left Azurecrest after the fizzle last night. "'I suppose you are wondering where you are. "'It is enough for you to know that you will never leave this room "'until we have had an understanding, "'and that for the present you may regard yourself as my prisoner.' Your confederates will never find you, and you may as well reconcile yourself to the fact that they are unable to help you. Tagala, gradually recovering breath and wits, looked balefully at the phantom. You, you will suffer for this, he muttered thickly. Again he strained at the cords around his ankles and wrists, but he soon saw that it was useless. We know how to deal with meddlers. The phantom smiled complacently. As yet it had not occurred to his prisoner to cry for help, and the phantom had no fear of the result if he should do so. Though Slade and the others were not far away, they were as harmless as if they did not exist. Save for the ventilating shaft, the room was practically soundproof and the exits were so completely hidden that they would never be able to locate the chamber. "'We shall see,' was his calm response. "'Mr. Shea appears to be a very shrewd man, but even he has his limitations. The infirmities of age are beginning to show a marked effect on his strategy. He is too old for this sort of thing.' 
So, said the scientist in queer tones, you think you know him? The phantom nodded. I had an encounter with him some years ago, and he proved to me then that he had extraordinary astuteness. As a matter of fact, he was a little too much for me. The other day I ran into him by accident, and we had quite a pleasant little chat. Tagala lay motionless on the cot, while his eyes, slowly recovering their customary brilliance, searched the phantom's face. "'The police are laboring under the delusion that you are Mr. Shea,' he dryly observed. "'Oh, well, the police are not particularly bright at times,' the phantom shrugged. "'Now, doctor, you and I are going to have a very serious talk. I was outmaneuvered last night, but this is my round. I shall convince you by a very simple method that it will be wise for you to place the antidote in my hands.' Despite his humiliation and physical discomfort, the doctor gave a contemptuous laugh. "'Fool!' he snorted. "'Every move you make is foredoomed to failure. We have provided against every possible emergency. Our plan is already a certain success. Only this afternoon Mr. Shea telephones me from New York that everything is going well.' A group of the most celebrated physicians in America have held several consultations without practical results. They are utterly at a loss to diagnose the disease or to prescribe even a palliative. Poor idiots! It took me years to perfect the toxin, and they have only a few days in which to combat its effects. On the seventh day after the inoculation, the seven subjects will be doomed unless the antidote is administered in the meantime. After the seventh day, it will be too late. Mr. Shea told me that two of the subjects are already in a mood to discuss terms. Perhaps by tomorrow they will place half of their fortunes at Mr. Shea's feet. "'You seem very confident of success,' observed the phantom. Our success is already assured. In a few days I shall be wealthier than I ever before dreamed of being. Some people scoff at money, but it is an excellent thing for all that. All my life, while pursuing my scientific investigations, I have had my eye on what you Americans call the main chance. I never dreamed that I should realize my hopes through an accidental discovery. Ever hear of the Datura plant? The phantom shook his head. It grows in great profusion in my native soil, the Malay states, but it can be transplanted or produced almost anywhere. It is an odd plant, from four to six feet high, with wide-spreading branches and black flowers that are shaped like trumpets. Children have been known to die after eating the seeds, which are very poisonous. A few years ago, after an extensive tour in Europe, I returned to my native land and was called upon to treat a child who had eaten a great quantity of the seeds. It was then I made the discovery that shall make me a wealthy man in a few days. It was a mere accident, but isn't our whole life a series of accidents? He smiled philosophically, for he had quite recovered from the effects of his recent humiliation. "'If you will permit me to explain a little further,' he went on, "'I think you will understand how invincible we are and how foolish it is for you to oppose us. The poisonous property of the Datura plant is known as Daturin. It is a very curious drug. Its active principle is a mixture of a kind of atropine and hyoscyamine, but the true nature of the component alkaloids has never been fully determined. It is one of the mysteries of nature. Among the symptoms of datura poisoning are hoarseness, dryness of the mouth, dilation of the pupils, disturbed heart action, bad memory, and a curious vocal affection that produces involuntary laughter. 
no chemical antidote has been either known or suggested until i made my accidental discovery it has suited my purpose to keep that discovery to myself there was an elated smirk on his face and the phantom turned away in disgust i came to america continued the doctor in oily tones and by mere chance made the acquaintance of our remarkable Mr. Shea. I shall not weary you by reciting all the details. I happened to mention my discovery to Mr. Shea, and his brilliant mind immediately conceived the idea of putting it to a highly profitable use. Like all great things, his plan was simplicity itself. His theory was based on the fact so aptly stated by yourself last night, that the average run of mortals can be most effectively controlled through the factor of fear. He suggested that if a deadly malady were communicated to a number of wealthy men, they could easily be persuaded to pay almost any price for a sure antidote, especially if the antidote were the exclusive property of an individual or an organization that was the beginning of the idea it required quite a little elaboration the chief factors in the plan were the poison and the antidote the antidote was in readiness but the poison had to be so adjusted that it would produce death within a specified time unless the antidote were administered meanwhile if the plan was to succeed we must be in a position to tell the subjects that they would die within a certain number of days unless they paid our price for the antidote. You probably know, since you appear to be an educated man, that the ancient Chinese knew how to adjust poisons so as to produce death within a certain time. All my life I have been making special studies along that line and my discoveries proved very valuable in connection with Mr. Shea's project. Yet, for a long time, I was unable to adjust the poison with sufficient accuracy. With Mr. Shea's assistance, I fitted up a laboratory here and began making additional researches. It was necessary to have human subjects for the experience, and Mr. Shea furnished me several. Two or three, who were inoculated in the early stages of the work, failed to react properly to the antidote, and one or two of them were unfortunate enough to die. "'You murdered them in plain words,' suggested the phantom curtly. "'Harsh words, my dear gray phantom. As a whole, the experiments were highly successful.' I discovered how to adjust the poison so as to produce death within a specified time. We were now ready to go ahead with the plan. Mr. Shea selected the victims, and I showed a number of his most trusted men how the poison was to be injected. Each of these, with an assistant, was assigned to one of the seven victims chosen by Mr. Shea, and the whole number of inoculations were successfully accomplished the other night. In a few days— "'What about Miss Darrow?' inquired the phantom brusquely. "'What did you gain by murdering her?' "'Really, I wish you would drop that unpleasant word from your vocabulary. Miss Darrow had been unfortunate enough to learn certain facts which were detrimental to Mr. Shea.' She had been watched constantly, and she was followed to the Thelma that night. Her actions were peculiar, and Mr. Shea's agents suspected she was on the point of making embarrassing revelations. I was in New York at the time, and happened to be within reach, so the agents communicated with me. I arrived just in time to prevent unpleasant consequences. In another moment she might have made some very damaging disclosures. In fact, she had already sent a peculiarly worded note to that remarkable person whose name eludes me. "'Vincent Starr?' suggested the phantom. "'Precisely. Mr. Starr is one of your highly temperamental geniuses. Just how much Miss Darrow had learned will never be known.' 
but I thought it advisable to act promptly. The amount of poison I injected into her veins was carefully calculated to produce death within a few minutes. The phantom mastered his sense of loathing. What he was learning might prove highly useful later on. "'Wouldn't a knife thrust have been quicker and safer?' he suggested. "'Even in the few minutes between the inoculation of the poison and Miss Darrow's death, she might have blurted out all she knew.' "'There was slight danger of that. The poison always blunts one's mental faculties, especially when given in such a large dose. It was very unlikely that Miss Darrow would speak coherently in the brief interval when the poison acted. A quick thrust with a knife would perhaps have been safer, but we needed the moral effect. The what? The satisfied gleam in the doctor's eyes testified that he was quite at ease once more, despite the cords that incapacitated him for action. Yes, the moral effect was valuable. You see, the seven victims selected by Mr. Shea had to be impressed with the deadliness of the poison. Unless they were thoroughly convinced that the poison would kill, they might not have been amenable to reason. Miss Darrow's death, coming just a day or two before the seven were inoculated, was a valuable object lesson. An oily smile creased the scientist's swarthy features. Once more, despite his uncomfortable position, he seemed hugely content. "'No doubt,' admitted the phantom, ironically, "'Mr. Shea doesn't seem to have overlooked anything. What I can't understand is why you, a man of scientific attainments, should consent to do the bidding of such a blackguard.' "'Wealth is a very excellent thing,' said Tagala, musingly. "'It is even more desirable than fame. Mr. Shea has put me in the way of acquiring a great fortune, so why should I not serve him?' "'And what are you going to do with the money after you have acquired it by such vile methods, granting that your scheme succeeds?' "'Enjoy life, my friend.' The doctor's repulsive features were wreathed in smiles. "'I have a great capacity for appreciating the beautiful things in life. Nature works by contrasts. She treated me very shabbily as far as physical characteristics are concerned, but by way of compensation she gave me a taste for the only things that really matter. I intend to surround myself with luxuries that an Indian Maharaja might envy. I intend to feast my eyes on the costliest and the best the world can produce. Now, perhaps you understand?" The phantom nodded. Inwardly he tingled and glowed, but his face showed nothing but boredom and disgust. The insight he had just obtained into Tagala's character would have an important bearing on his plan. "'And now that we understand each other,' the doctor continued, "'let us terminate this rather dreary farce. "'This little room is pleasant enough, "'but I never sleep well in strange places, "'and these cords are not inducive to repose. "'You will be free to go wherever you please "'as soon as we have settled the little matter "'I mentioned a moment ago. "'Ah, then you persist in your foolish determination.' Your experience last night should have convinced you of the futility of your efforts, but I see you are as stubborn as ever. More so, the phantom assured him. I have discovered a new weapon since last night. Before you leave this room, you will have told me where the antidote is hidden. Tagala grinned insolently. He tilted his head back against the pillow and complacently regarded the phantom. "'You are very amusing,' he murmured. "'I thought that—' He stopped and looked toward a corner of the ceiling. The phantom followed his glance, and his figure tensed perceptibly. From somewhere above their heads came strains of soft, lilting laughter, edged now and then with a hysterical vibration. 
a pallor began to spread over the phantom's face. "'There, my dear gray phantom,' said the doctor elatedly, "'is your answer.' The phantom clenched his fingers spasmodically. His face was hard and his eyes held a strange gleam. "'You are mistaken, doctor.' He clipped off the words with sinister precision. "'Until a moment ago I had silly scruples about employing my latest weapon. After hearing that,' and he inclined his head toward the corner of the ceiling, I have concluded that any methods are fair when dealing with scoundrels of your type. That is obviously true, assented Tagala cheerfully. The only difficulty is that any methods you employ are certain to prove ineffective. Please don't make any more threats against my life. I should laugh, and that would be impolite. The phantom came a step nearer the cot. No, he said grimly, I have no intention of doing anything so futile. I have the best reason in the world for not wanting you to die just yet. Also, I have discovered a much more effective way of dealing with you. An odd emphasis in his tones seemed to impress the doctor. A flicker of uneasiness crossed his face, but it was gone in a moment. Ah, he murmured derisively. I might have foreseen it. You mean to force me to surrender the antidote by torturing me. It is an improvement on your previous method, but it will prove just as useless. Torture is unpleasant, but I can endure any amount of it. Mistaken again, doctor. Torture is a little too crude, and I am not sure you are the type of man that could be influenced by it. The plan I have in mind is subtler and surer. You told me a moment ago that your highest aim in life is the employment of beautiful things and the pursuit of pleasure. I told you the truth. This time there was a trace of bewilderment in Tagala's tones. From his pocket the phantom drew the bottle he had taken from the laboratory. He studied the label with a preoccupied air then held it so the man on the cot could read the inscription. Tagala's eye narrowed in perplexity. "'I have been told,' said the phantom casually, "'that a single drop of this fluid, when injected into the eye, is sufficient to cause blindness.' The doctor's hands and feet strained spasmodically against the cords. A quick muscular contraction told that the phantom had found his sensitive spot. Blind men are not particularly appreciative of the luxuries and pleasures you so vividly described a while ago, the phantom went on. His voice was soft, but there was a faint throb to his tones. What good will it do a man to accumulate costly and beautiful things if he can't see them? A grayish tinge crept into Tagala's face. His eyes, with a look of horror lurking in their depths, were fixed rigidly on the phantom's face. The phantom held the bottle to the light. A faint but ominous smile was playing about his lips. "'Just a drop of colorless liquid,' he murmured. "'But what a different complexion it would put on your prospects, Tagala.' All the money you hope to get through Mr. Shea would be only so much rubbish. All the wealth in the world couldn't relieve your misery. Don't you think you had better reconsider? The scientist's lips fluttered, but no words came. A look of abhorrence accentuated the repulsiveness of his face. With a quick movement, the phantom stepped toward the cot, the doctor wiggled and squirmed, but was unable to move. Perhaps just to convince you that I am in earnest, I had better begin by blinding the left eye now, the phantom went on, bending slightly over the trembling man. With two fingers of one hand, he pressed back the lids of the doctor's left eye while holding the bottle in the other. The scientist rolled from side to side 
but the firm pressure of the phantom's knee against his chest checked his efforts. Finally, as the phantom was tilting the little bottle against the exposed eye, a great sigh of horror broke from the doctor's lips. "'Stop!' he cried, almost overcome by terror. "'You have won. I will do anything you demand. Only don't blind me.' Chapter 18 THE FIGURE ON THE STAIRS The phantom could scarcely hold back a cry of exultation as he saw the abject fear written in Dr. Tagala's face. Knowing how ingeniously Mr. Shea had laid his plans and guarded against every imaginable emergency, he had not been altogether certain that his artful contrivance would succeed. But the scientist's acute distress was ample proof that Mr. Shea had been outmaneuvered and that the gray phantom was master of the situation. "'It appears Mr. Shea has overlooked something after all.' observed the phantom in tones that expressed his elation. "'Now, doctor, let me warn you that evasions and trickery will only aggravate your position. Where is the antidote?' Tagala seemed to be making an effort to gather his scattered thoughts. "'If I tell you, will you release me at once?' he asked shakily. "'All I promise is to spare your eyesight,' declared the phantom, still holding the little bottle in dangerous proximity to the scientist's terror-filled eyes. "'You will have to be content with that, and I am really letting you off very easily. Now answer my question.' The doctor glanced at the bottle, gave an involuntary shudder, and seemed to be trying hard to think clearly. "'The antidote,' he finally managed to say, is hidden in the wall of my bedroom, exactly one foot from the window and directly above the head of the bed. The wall is apparently solid, but if you will carefully run your hand over the space I have indicated, you will find a slight protuberance. A light pressure on it will release a hidden panel, and inside you will find a number of small bottles, each one containing a full course of treatment. You will find complete directions on the label. The phantom searched his face, but found no signs of guile. "'I hope for your sake that you have told the truth,' he said sharply. "'I shall be back as soon as I have verified your statement.' He examined the cords around the doctor's feet and hands and saw that they were securely tied. Then he stepped out of the little chamber carefully closing the sliding door before he ran up the stairs. Even now he could scarcely realize that his stratagem had succeeded. There were still dangers and obstacles in the way, but somehow he would win out. He would take as many bottles as his pockets could hold, then he would find Helen, and they could easily make their escape through the tunnel. His imagination pictured Mr. Shea's discomfiture when he should learn that this stupendous scheme had failed. The phantom drew his revolver before stepping out in the hall. The slightest slip or a chance encounter might easily reverse the situation and turn the tables against him. His feet glided soundlessly over the floor till he came to the laboratory. A quick glance up and down the corridor assured him that so far he was safe. He opened the door and entered the bedroom at the side of the laboratory. Now he took out his electric flash, placed his automatic within easy reach of the bed, then gingerly ran his fingers over the area specified by Dr. Tagala. In a short time he had found the slight protuberance mentioned by the doctor, but he hesitated for several moments before pressing it. First he carefully examined the surrounding space, looking everywhere for hidden wires. Even when controlled by terror, the wily scientist was not to be trusted, and the phantom had no intention of walking blindly into a trap. His search satisfied him, however, and finally he placed a finger on the tiny projection and pressed inward. 
Almost instantly, a narrow portion of the wall opened. Within, arranged in an orderly row on a shelf, stood a number of small bottles. He drew a long breath of intense relief. Before him was visible proof that he had frightened the truth out of the scientist. His head swam a little as he contemplated his success. Each one of the bottles would have netted Mr. Shea a fortune if the audacious plan had succeeded. What seemed more wonderful still, one of them would save the life of Helen Hardwick. The phantom's hand trembled excitedly as he reached out and clutched one of the bottles. In the next instant his hand darted back. Something was wrong, for the bottle was immovable, as if clamped down with rivets, and a hideous suspicion flashed through the phantom's mind. Simultaneously there came a loud clanging which reverberated throughout the house, confirming his agonizing suspicion that a gong had been released the moment his hand touched the bottle. He had blundered into a trap after all. For an instant he marveled dazedly at the almost uncanny scope of Mr. Shea's precautions. Then, suddenly alert and tense once more, he put the electric flashlight back into his pocket and snatched up his automatic. The clangor of the gong, resounding throughout the entire house, was almost deafening. Overhead, doors were slamming and voices shouting excitedly. From the direction of the stairs came a tumultuous clatter and above the hubbub he caught the intense tones of Slade's commands. He cast a glance at the window, its outlines delineated by a gray dusk against the darker background. But flight was out of the question, for he could not leave Helen behind him. The phantom steeled himself for battle. Often in the past he had fought against overwhelming odds, and this time something far greater than his life depended on the outcome. Every vain tingling, he left the bedroom and crossed the floor of the laboratory. Maintaining a steady grip on his automatic, he pushed the door open and stepped out into the hall. A chorus of shouts greeted his appearance. Men in various stages of attire were running excitedly up and down the corridor, but all stopped at sight of the tall, tense figure standing with his back against the laboratory door. His eyes, hard as steel and swift as speeding arrows, surveyed them narrowly with a long, comprehensive sweep. The barrel of his automatic, held in readiness for instant action, glimmered ominously in the dim light shed by a single bulb in the ceiling. The gray phantom! was the hushed whisper that went back and forth in the huddled crowd. A spell seemed to fall over them as they stared at the man of whose amazing exploits they had heard and read, but whom few of them had seen until now. But their inaction lasted only a few moments. Some of the bolder ones were already crowding forward. "'Stop!' cried the phantom. The gong had ceased ringing, and his voice rang sharp and clear down the hall. "'The first man that moves will get a bullet.' Momentarily awed by the metallic tones, the crowd fell back. The phantom's glittering eyes seemed to encompass them all in their sweep, and there was an air of desperate determination about his tense, slightly crouching figure that impressed them strongly. The situation was the most critical the phantom had ever faced, yet he felt a tingle of triumph as he surveyed the huddled throng. Any one of them could have crippled or killed him with a well-aimed shot, but not a hand moved. For the moment, at least, he was holding them in subjection through the sheer strength of his domineering personality and his attitude of utter fearlessness. Someone laughed and the phantom's eyes turned to Slade, standing on the outer fringe of the crowd. He held a pistol in his hand, but the muzzle was pointed downward. "'You must be crazy,' he said contemptuously. 
Can't you see that you are outnumbered eleven to one? I hadn't taken time to count, said the phantom calmly. In the same instant a crack and a flash of fire came from his automatic. One of the crowd, more intrepid than the others, had ventured forward as he spoke, and now a yell of pain signified that the phantom had aimed straight. Slade scowled. On his face was a look of mingled wonder and rage. "'Mr. Shea's orders are not to kill you unless necessary,' he explained. "'And I have been hoping you wouldn't make it necessary. Mr. Shea has the highest admiration for you.' "'Thanks,' said the phantom dryly, and for a mere instant his thoughts went back to the ludicrous figure of Fairspeckle. "'It's too bad I can't say that the sentiment is mutual.' Slade's scowl deepened. He seemed inclined to instruct his men to advance, but something evidently restrained him. "'You ought to know by this time that Mr. Shea is invincible,' he declared impressively. "'You are a wonder in some ways, but a fool in others. How you keep slipping in and out of this house is beyond me. Not that it matters, for you have sung your last tune.' What have you done to Dr. Tagala? A thin smile hovered above the phantom's compressed lips. I suppose you have kidnapped him, Slade went on, but we will find him before long. You see, Mr. Shea foresaw even such a possibility as that and prepared for it. He anticipated that pressure of some sort might be used on Tagala to make him reveal where the antidote is hidden, and so he prepared the trap you walked into a moment ago. The bottles, as you may have guessed by this time, contain only water. The real antidote is elsewhere, and Tagala is the only man who can put his hand on it. So I understand. There was a momentary flicker in the phantom's eyes, which indicated that Slade's words had suggested something of importance to him. Mr. Shea is amazingly clever, but there is such a thing as being too clever. Slade looked as if he sensed a hidden meaning which his mind could not quite grasp. Presently he shrugged and fixed his frosty gaze on the phantom. "'I'll give you just one more chance to surrender,' he warned. "'Throw down your pistol and tell us where Tagala is, and I promise you will not be harmed.' very anxious to learn Tagala's whereabouts, aren't you, Slade? Without Tagala you can't find the antidote, and without the antidote your beautiful scheme goes to pieces. It would be very awkward for you if you shouldn't be able to deliver the goods when your seven victims have come around to the point where they are willing to pay your price. Slade mumbled something under his breath. Again the phantom's eyes darted over the fringe of sullen faces in the background. He was gambling for Helen's life and his own, and he still held one card in reserve. "'Tagala seems to be the key to the whole situation,' he went on. "'I have hidden him in a place where you will never find him, even if you search from now till doomsday. Men sometimes die of hunger in three days.' especially if they do a lot of fretting in the meantime. Slade, why don't you order your men to shoot me? The last sentence was spoken in taunting tones, and Slade's face showed that the jibe had gone home. Inwardly fuming, he glared savagely at the phantom. Is it because you realize that, if I am killed, Tagala will die with me? The phantom's smile told that he once more felt he was master of the situation. "'Is that the reason, Slade?' Slade grumbled inarticulately. He glanced gloomily at the men lined up behind him. Then he looked again at the phantom, and his face took on a baffled look. He seemed unable to account for the fact that one man, single-handed, was holding nine at bay. 
Suddenly, as his glance flitted up and down the phantom's tense figure, his face brightened a trifle. He whispered something in the ear of the man at his side, and the latter immediately hurried away. The phantom felt a twinge of misgiving. It was evident from the gratified smirk on Slade's lips that an inspiration had just occurred to him, and that he was planning a surprise of some sort. The phantom wondered whether the resourceful Mr. Shea had provided against this latest emergency as he had against the others. He waited in a state of tremulous tension, and presently a slight sound drew his attention to the stairs at the end of the hall. He glanced aside out of the tail of an eye, and then sudden despair took hold of him. Halfway up the stairs, gazing blankly down upon the scene in the hall, stood Helen Hardwick. There was a look in her face that caused a groan to break from the phantom's lips. Suddenly he stiffened. In an instant he saw the meaning of the elated smile on Slade's face. Directly behind Helen he discerned a crouching figure, evidently the man who had left the hall a few minutes before. "'Splendid!' ejaculated Slade. "'I see you have already glimpsed the idea. At this very moment the muzzle of a pistol is pressing against Miss Hardwick's back. The slightest pressure on the trigger will send a bullet through her heart. You cannot fire at him, much as you would like to do so, for Miss Hardwick's figure makes an excellent bulwark. Will you admit you are beaten?' Torn between rage and despair, the phantom gazed rigidly at Helen. The stolid expression on her face showed plainly that she had not the faintest inkling of what was going on. Now and then her lips twitched as if she were on the point of laughing. Of the figure crouching behind her, only an elbow and a narrow strip of shoulder were visible. An anguished cry rose in the phantom's throat as he saw the full infamy of Slade's ruse. "'I shall begin to count,' said Slade in triumphant tones. "'If, by the time I come to ten, you have not signified by throwing down your pistol that you are willing to surrender, Miss Hardwick will die instantly.' A hush, charged with an electric tension, followed the ultimatum. Then, slowly and evenly, Slade began to count. One, two, three, four, five. Chapter 19 A Futile Search Walking with his usual listless and shuffling gait, Lieutenant Culligore mounted the steps in front of police headquarters, and entered the office of Inspector Stapleton of the Detective Bureau. It was late in the afternoon, and Culligore might have quickened his steps and carried himself with more animation if he could have known that at this very moment the gray phantom, seated in the secret chamber at Azurecrest, was planning his second move against the redoubtable Mr. Shea. Stapleton, a huge, thick-necked man with a reddish face, and a tendency toward irascibility, looked up with a scowl as the lieutenant walked in. "'Well, what's new?' he demanded. "'Nothing,' said Culligore patiently, and flopped into a chair beside the inspector's desk. "'Except that our friend Mr. Shea seems to be getting away with it.' Stapleton glared at a pile of newspapers he had been reading. His temper was on edge from his perusal of several editorials that chided the Bureau for its failure to circumvent Mr. Shea. Two of the seven money bags are already showing the white feather, Culligore continued, and two or three of the others are getting wobbly. By the end of the week, I guess most of them will be ready to pay Mr. Shea's price. I don't know how he means to manage the transaction but I'll bet a pair of pink socks he'll figure out a safe way. What are the doctors doing? Still loafing on the job, I suppose. 
They're up a tree, every mother's son of them. They can't dope out the disease at all. If they had seven months instead of seven days, they might be able to do something. But, as it is, they're at the end of their tether. Their only hope is that one of the seven will be obliging enough to die before the others, so they can perform an autopsy. Stapleton jerked his head savagely to one side. "'This is the twentieth century, and we're living in a civilized country,' he muttered. A man can't put over a thing like that in these times. Just what I've been telling myself for the last three days, admitted Culligore. I've been saying it can't be done, but Mr. Shea is going right ahead and doing it, and he's pulling the trick right under our noses, supplemented the inspector. That's what gets my goat. It's plain as day that Mr. Shea is the gray phantom. Nobody but the gray phantom ever got away with a thing like this, and this job has all the earmarks of his work. Well, and his huge fist descended on the desk with a slam, we'll get him yet, and when we do, I'll see to it that he's put away for keeps. Culligore drew the palm of his hand across his mouth as if to stifle one of his infrequent grins. "'Keeping something up your sleeve again?' demanded the inspector, who had noticed the gesture. "'If you've got something on your mind, why don't you spring it?' The lieutenant shifted his lanky figure in the chair. "'I've been trying all day to get a line on Fairspeckle,' he said slowly, without directly answering the inspector's question. "'Queer how that old duffer vamoosed. I tried to question the jab valet.' but all he knows is that there are two bumps on his head where there was only one before. The doctor and the nurse got rough treatment, too. Of a sudden, the lights went out, and old Fairspeckle seemed to go out with them. Anyhow, he was gone when the doctor came, too. Culligore paused to light one of his vicious-looking cigars. Something queer about that old goat's disappearance, eh, Inspector? Stapleton stared hard at his subordinate, as if trying to read the thoughts stirring behind his stolid countenance. "'Of course there is,' he said irritably. "'There's something queer about every disappearance. Just what are you driving at? You don't doubt that Fairspeckle was kidnapped by Mr. Shea's agents?' "'I doubt everything, Inspector.' Know of any reason why Mr. Shea should go out of his way to abduct the old geezer? No, I don't, admitted Stapleton, after some thought. The kidnapping of Fairspeckle doesn't seem to fit into the pattern of Mr. Shea's scheme. What's your idea, Culligore? You don't suppose Fairspeckle kidnapped himself? Stranger things have happened, Inspector. By the way and the lieutenant reached into his pocket and took out several typewritten slips. I meant to hand you these yesterday, but was too busy with other things. I found them beside the typewriter on Fairspeckle's desk. What do you make of them? Stapleton picked up the slips and glanced at them. His eyes widened into a stare as he read the typewritten lines. He read them twice, and then he transferred his gaze to Culligore. "'Holy mackerel!' he muttered. Then he sat silent for a time, wriggling his ample frame to and fro in the chair. "'Why, these things make it look as though Fair Speckle was Mr. Shea. "'They show us that the mystery isn't quite so simple as you thought, Inspector.' They sort of knock the pins from under your theory that the gray phantom is Mr. Shea. For a few moments longer, Stapleton's bewildered eyes rested on the slips. Then he read aloud the list of names beneath the introductory paragraph, and the pucker on his forehead deepened. Finally, he looked quizzically at the lieutenant. Yes, I noticed it too, said Culligore. There's something queer about that list. Looks as though Mr. Shea, whoever he is, hadn't followed his original program. Seven men were inoculated, 
but only five of them are named in Fairspeckle's list. The other two names don't jibe. Stapleton pondered for a while. He seemed to have great difficulty readjusting his thoughts to a new fact. And here's another interesting thing, Culligore pointed out. Every one of the seven men mentioned in Fairspeckle's list was a member of a ring that fought him tooth and nail some years ago. And this is Fairspeckle's way of getting even with them, ventured the inspector. Maybe, said Culligore guardedly. Anyhow, a fairly strong motive could be made out of it. But how do you account for the fact that Fairspeckle didn't carry out his original program? I'm not trying to account for it just now. There might have been a slip of some kind. If Fairspeckle is Mr. Shea, the fact that he revised his list doesn't really cut any ice. Any man has a right to change his mind. Inspector Stapleton sat up straight. He looked at Culligore in a determined way. "'What I can't understand is why you didn't show me these slips yesterday. You say you were too busy with other things. I'd like to know what other things could be more important. Never mind that, though. The thing to do now is to find Fair Speckle." Again Culligore drew his palm across his mouth. "'And when you have found him, Inspector, what are you going to do with him?' "'Eh?' Stapleton seemed to think the question a strange one. "'Do with him? Why, we'll see to it that he gets the stiffest sentence the law provides. If we once get our hands on him, we'll put him in a place where he won't be able to trouble us for some time.' "'Aren't you overlooking something, Inspector?' Stapleton stared perplexedly at his subordinate. "'What about the seven capitalists?' the lieutenant went on. "'They'll die like rats unless the antidote is administered in time. You can't make Mr. Shea fork over the antidote by putting him in jail. He's wise enough to know that as long as the antidote is in his possession, he has a hold on us, and he won't be likely to give it up. He knows we are not going to let seven of the biggest men in the country die just for the sake of sending him to jail. The fact is, Inspector, that Mr. Shea has us sewed up in a sack. Stapleton seemed about to make an indignant reply, but it died on his tongue. Evidently Culligore's argument had made a strong impression. He dropped back against the chair and peered diffidently into space. I'm hanged if I'm going to sit with arms folded and let Mr. Shea put this thing over, he muttered at last. He's a slick crook, but there ought to be a way of dealing with him. I think there is, Inspector, agreed Culligore, leisurely rising from his chair. I can't see it just yet, but maybe my mind will work better after a little walk. So long, Inspector. He shuffled from the room, followed by Inspector Stapleton's puzzled gaze. After leaving the headquarters building, he walked to a nearby restaurant and ordered a substantial meal. He seemed in no hurry, for he ate slowly and lingered for a considerable time over his coffee and cigar. An observer, noticing his languid air and phlegmatic expression, might have thought that Mr. Shea was farthest from his mind. It was dark when he left the restaurant, and it was a little after eight o'clock when, after a leisurely stroll in a zigzagging direction, he reached the Thelma Theater. His decision to visit the Thelma once more might have been due to the fact that it had been the scene of several mysterious incidents which were more or less directly traceable to the activities of Mr. Shea. The death of Virginia Darrow had occurred there, and the bullet that had missed the gray phantom by such a narrow margin was still embedded in one of the pillars. But Culligore's expression gave no indication of his purpose as he stood on the sidewalk across the street from the theater and glanced up at the windows of Vincent Starr's private office on the second floor. 
The windows were dark, so evidently Star was not there, and the entire structure presented a gloomy and lifeless appearance. Culligore hummed a little tune as he walked to the nearest street intersection, then cut diagonally across the thoroughfare, continued half a block to the west, and finally ducked into a dark basement entrance. The ease with which he made his way suggested that he had traveled the same route before. After walking down a dirty and foul-smelling passage, he emerged into a vacant space bordered at one side by the rear wall of the theater. He crossed the enclosure, then ran down a short stairway and brought up against a door. Now he took a number of keys from his pocket and tried several in the lock before he found one that fitted. At last the door came open, and the lieutenant, locking it carefully behind him, stood in the basement under the Thelma Theater. On all sides was total darkness. For a time he stood still, listening for sounds, but nothing but dull and distant noises from the outside reached his ears. Having satisfied himself that he was apparently alone in the basement, he took out his flashlight and began a thorough and comprehensive search. With the electric flash peering into every nook and corner, he explored the dressing rooms, peeped behind piles of discarded scenery, examined odds and ends of stage property, looked into the barrels and boxes of the dusty storerooms, and even tapped the walls here and there to assure himself that there were no hollow spaces. At last he gave up. His search had taken almost an hour, and it had been complete and painstaking in every respect, yet Lieutenant Culligore seemed not quite satisfied. On his face was a look of hesitancy that seemed to suggest a lingering suspicion that something might have eluded him. Standing in the center of the basement, he extinguished the flashlight, for it had been his experience that his other senses were more acute when his eyes received no impressions. For a little while, standing in impenetrable darkness, he scarcely breathed. He had a curious sensation that a faint sound was passing him and dissolving in the dank air. It was so slight and elusive that his ears could scarcely detect it, yet it appealed to his imagination with peculiar insistence. It might have been either a moan or a sigh, or perhaps a cry coming from a great distance. Somehow, though he could not analyze the sensation, he fancied it expressed a great, overwhelming anguish. Whether it came from above, below, or the sides he could not determine, but it inspired him with a haunting feeling that he was not alone. Again he took up the flash, and instantly the impression vanished, as if it had been a wraith fleeing from the light. Once more, step by step, he went over every square foot of the basement, covering the ground he had already searched so patiently, but he found nothing that gave the slightest clue to the peculiar sound. Finally, half inclined to believe that his imagination had deceived him, he ascended the stairway and continued his search on the ground floor. With dogged determination, he explored the space in the wings and back of the stage, then went up and down the aisles in the auditorium. His inspection of the boxes was fruitless, and he found nothing of significance in the little niche where, on his previous visit to the Thelma, he had strongly suspected that an eavesdropper was hiding. Finally he went through the offices on the street front, occupied, as was indicated by the brass plates on the doors, by the treasurer, business manager, and stage director. Here also his quest was unavailing, and nothing now remained but Vincent Starr's private office on the upper floor. The moment he entered, Culligore felt as though he were invading the den of a Sybarite. His flashlight, flitting slowly over the room, revealed soft color harmonies and exquisite decorations. 
faint and delicate perfumes mingled with the fresh and alluring scents of flowers. Culligore's feet sank deep into costly rugs as he moved about the office, peeping behind chairs, desks, and cabinets, and occasionally sounding the walls for hollow spaces. After an hour of intense and patient effort, he was forced to admit that he had exerted himself needlessly and that his impressions, while standing in the basement, could have been nothing but figments of his fancy. Finally, he sat down in the luxuriously upholstered chair beside Starr's desk. His watch showed a quarter past eleven, and he tried to reconcile himself to the thought that the only thing he could do was to go home and sleep. He was disappointed, for he had hoped that his search would yield some tangible results. He scowled a little as his gaze roamed idly over the orderly piles of papers on the desk. The inkstand, the paper cutter, and the pens were all of ornamental design. The only plain and undecorative objects in the room were the two telephones standing at one side of the desk. It struck him as a little odd that there should be two of them, but then he noticed that one was an automatic instrument without outside connections and communicating only with the various departments in the building. Presently he yawned ostentatiously. He could not quite understand his reason for remaining after his fruitless task was done, nor could he comprehend the feeling, vague but uncannily persistent, that the next few minutes would bring some startling developments. A gentle buzzing caused him to sit up straight in the chair. The telephone was ringing, and instinctively he reached out his hand for one of the instruments. He spoke a soft hello into the transmitter. There was no response, but the ringing continued. A little dazedly he hung up the receiver and peered fixedly at the other telephone. He jerked it to him, thrust the transmitter to his ear, and instantly the buzzing ceased. A gasp of amazement fell from his lips. Someone was calling on the automatic telephone, the one that had no outside connections. The person calling must be inside the building then, despite the fact that his patient search had convinced him that there was no other human being within the four walls of the structure. Chapter 20 trapped. "'Hello! Hello!' shouted Culligore into the mouthpiece. From head to foot he was tingling with suspense. It was one of the rare occasions within recent years when he felt the thrill of excitement. A hoarse and rasping voice responded, but at first he could make out no words. The person at the other end seemed to speak with great difficulty and was evidently on the verge of hysterics. "'Speak a little louder, can't you?' urged the lieutenant. "'Who are you?' A jumble of split words and syllables sounded distantly in his ear. Now and then, between efforts to speak clearly, came a titter and a giggle that awoke a startling suspicion in Culligore's mind. "'Tell me who you are.' he said in loud tones. A short, cracked laugh came over the wire. It was followed by a groan, as if the speaker were despairing over his inability to make himself understood. Then he tried again. Fair, fair speckle. Oh! Culligore's teeth clicked out the exclamation. He nodded at the instrument as if the name just spoken had confirmed a suspicion in his mind. "'Where are you, Mr. Fairspeckle?' "'I can't, can't tell you,' came gropingly over the wire. "'Haven't you any idea?' "'None. I'm locked in a, a room, and I am dying. For God's sake, get me out.' "'Listen, Mr. Fairspeckle,' said Culligore tensely. "'You're somewhere in the Thelma Theater, and I'm going to find you. It may take some little time, but don't worry. It won't be very long.' 
A groan of relief, mingled with pent-up suspense, sounded in Culligore's ear, and then he slammed the receiver back on the hook. His eyes were twinkling, and there was a new eagerness in his face. He jumped up from the chair and took a step toward the door. Then he drew back, and in the next moment his face had resumed its habitual sluggish expression, and there was nothing in his manner to indicate that anything out of the ordinary had happened. The door opened, and in walked Vincent Starr. The theatrical manager, faultlessly attired in evening dress, top coat, and silk hat, shrank back at sight of the man standing beside the desk. Then, recognizing the lieutenant, he instantly gathered himself. "'You startled me, Culligore," he explained with an apologetic laugh. "'So many strange things have happened in this place that I am naturally a little nervous. I often come here late at night to read or write, according to my mood, but of late I approach the place in fear and trembling." He eyed the detective inquiringly. "'I wonder what brings you to my private office at such an hour?' "'Hope you don't mind my snooping,' said Culligore, genially. "'I have been looking around a bit. There were a couple of things I wanted to get straightened out in my mind. As you say yourself, there have been a lot of strange doings in this place, and I've got a sneaking suspicion that Mr. Shea is back of them all.' Starr doffed his hat and ran his fingers through his long, glossy hair. The discoloration of his nose had diminished greatly, but his face was still pale and drawn. "'That's precisely my idea,' he said nervously. "'I shall never feel safe until that scoundrel is behind iron bars. Unless he has a private grievance against me, I am at a loss to understand why he can't keep away from my theatre. By the way, did you obtain any light on the things that were puzzling you? Not much, said Culligore disgustedly, with a furtive glance at the telephone. I searched every square inch of the place without finding what I was after. Yes? Starr seemed politely curious. I infer, then, that you had a definite object in view? That you were not just searching at random? "'Oh, no!' Culligore looked about him, as if not quite at ease. "'I suppose we're alone?' "'Not another soul in the building. You can speak as freely as you like.' "'Then I'll tell you exactly what I think. The way Mr. Shea's men have been sneaking in and out of this place is mighty suggestive. Just why they should be turning your place into a rendezvous is something I don't understand.' but that's exactly what they seem to be doing. They were right on the job the night you opened your new play. They gave Virginia Darrow a shot of poison just at the psychological moment before she could spill what she knew. Then they sneaked the body away right under our eyes, and we have not yet discovered how they managed it. Only the other day somebody took a shot at either you or the Gray Phantom. All this looks mighty queer. It does, assented Starr. He took out a jewel-studded case and lighted a cigarette. His pale, uneasy eyes did not leave the detective's face for a moment. What is your theory? Culligore looked musingly into space. Mr. Shea is very clever, but he is of flesh and blood like the rest of us. There must be a simple and natural explanation for all these strange doings. I'll bet my hat that he has found a secret entrance to your place. Impossible, said Starr promptly. This theater was built according to my own directions, and my own architect supervised every detail of the construction. That may be, but I still stick to the idea of a secret entrance. Don't you see, Mr. Starr? Even if you didn't have such an entrance made when you constructed your theater, Mr. Shea's men may have drilled a hole through the wall or the floor somewhere. Nothing else explains how they have been slipping in and out of the place. 
"'But why?' demanded Starr, and his fingers trembled as he took the cigarette from his lips. "'Why should they do such a thing?' Culligore smiled faintly while his muddy little eyes scanned the other's face. "'I think you can make a pretty fair guess,' he said dryly. Starr's face turned a shade paler. For an instant there was a look of positive dread in his eyes, but it vanished quickly. A sad smile came to his lips. "'I see I must be frank with you,' he murmured, much as I dislike to discuss matters pertaining to my private life. Don't ask me to go into details, for there are excellent reasons why I should not do so. In plain words, I do not care to incriminate myself. I have not always been what I am today. There was a time, quite a number of years ago, when I led a very violent life and when the law and I were not on the best of terms. I made enemies, a number of them, and it is possible that they are pursuing me today. In fact, I... He paused, and his narrowing gaze slanted to the floor. Culligore repressed a start. In the intense silence of the moment he heard a faint buzzing. Somewhere, in one of the offices on the ground floor, a telephone was ringing, and he guessed that Fairspeckle had grown impatient and was calling one of the other departments of the intercommunicating system. In fact, Starr went on after a moment's pause, quickly controlling his astonishment, if I were to come face to face with Mr. Shea today, I strongly suspect that I would recognize in him one of my old enemies. Don't ask me to explain any further, Culligore. You will appreciate the delicacy of the matter. I do, and you've said enough to explain the funny doings that have been going on here. I want you to answer one question frankly. Have you any idea who Mr. Shea is? Have you? was Starr's prompt rejoinder. Culligore chuckled. Maybe I have and maybe I haven't. I'm pretty sure of one thing. Some people think the Gray Phantom is Mr. Shea, but they're dead wrong. Starr's lips twitched into a knowing smile. I agree with you there, Culligore. Shall we go a step farther? With the gray phantom eliminated, the range of available suspects narrows down to one man. Am I right? I think you are on the right track, Mr. Starr. The theatrical manager, once more quite composed, seemed to find a great deal of amusement in the speculative drift of the conversation. It is diverting to try to read other people's minds, he observed. I wonder how close I can come to an accurate reading of yours. A detective's thoughts travel a devious route, but I will try to look at the situation from your point of view, taking all the circumstances into account. If you were to mention the name of the one remaining suspect, I fancy it would be W. Rufus Fairspeckle. Culligore stared as if dumbfounded at the other's astuteness, but his lips curled into the faintest grin as soon as Starr averted his gaze. "'You might as well admit that I was right,' said the manager, with a smile of elation. "'For once a mere layman has read your mind like an open book. The next question is, what has become of Fair Speckle? Do you suppose—' He broke off short. His glance darted involuntarily to the automatic telephone on the desk. Its summons sounded clear and distinct in the tense silence. Once more a tinge of gray crept into his face. With a tightening of the lips he looked furtively at Culligore. Queer, muttered the lieutenant, fingering the green cord attached to the instrument and tracing it to the sound box. Someone is calling on the private wire, and you just told me that you and I were alone in the building. The buzzing continued. Starr stared helplessly at the instrument, but out of the tail of an eye 
he was watching the expression on the detective's face. Finally, with a jerk of the shoulders, he emerged from his daze. "'I don't understand it,' he murmured. "'But we shall soon see what it means.' He sat down and drew the instrument to him. His face took on a look of determination, but there was also a baffling and inscrutable expression that might have puzzled the detective. But Culligore's thoughts seemed to be elsewhere. He looked as though he foresaw a critical moment and realized that quick thinking and prompt action were necessary. While Starr was speaking into the telephone, he looked quickly about the room. From his vest pocket he took a small box and removed the lid, exposing a reddish substance that looked like salve. Rubbing a little of it onto his fingertips, he softly crossed the room and quickly smeared a thin coating of the reddish material on the doorknob. Star hung up the receiver just as the little box disappeared into Culligore's vest pocket. "'I don't understand it,' said the manager, frettingly. "'Someone was speaking. It was a man's voice, but I couldn't make out what he was trying to say. It is very mysterious.' He smiled faintly. "'It's beginning to look as though I was mistaken, and there was someone else in the building besides you and me.' "'It certainly looks queer,' admitted Culligore. "'I searched everywhere, but we might as well go over the ground again.' Starr acquiesced readily, and Culligore saw to it that the manager preceded him out of the room. He noticed with gratification that the other's fingers closed firmly around the knob as he opened the door, and he knew that Starr was too preoccupied to take heed of the faint smear left on his hand from contact with the greased metal. He chuckled inwardly as he followed the manager down the stairs and through the offices in front of the building. After a brief and somewhat perfunctory search, they entered the auditorium. "'Shall I switch on the lights?' whispered Starr, walking beside the detective. "'I wouldn't. If there's a prowler around the place, we don't want to warn him. My electric flash will do.' For a time they conducted the search in silence, the detective cautiously darting the electric gleam over floor and walls and into dark corners. Finally he paused before a niche in the wall and pointed to an aperture behind the marble shelf that spanned the opening. "'Do you know,' he whispered, "'that the other day, while I was talking with the Grey Phantom, I had a funny feeling someone was hiding back there and listening to our conversation.' "'Who do you suppose it could have been?' There was no response. Culligore had been peering into the recess behind the marble ledge. Now he looked up quickly, but Star was gone, and the twitching of the detective's lips signified that the manager's sudden disappearance did not surprise him greatly. In an instant he was amazingly alert. Jerking his electric flash hither and thither, he moved quickly back and forth within the narrow space where he had last seen the manager sweeping the surrounding objects with his electric gleam and examining the surfaces of chairs, pillars, walls, and decorative articles. Presently he brought up in front of one of the larger pillars supporting the balcony. He had previously noticed its huge dimensions, and now he gauged them again with a quickly calculating eye. It was there the gray phantom had stood when the mysterious shot was fired the other day, and Helen Hardwick had been leaning against the same pillar when the curious individual with the repulsive features glided past her. The electric gleam moved swiftly over the white surface of the post with its ornate trimmings of dull gold. Again, as once or twice before, he wondered whether there was any hidden significance in the fact that the gray phantom had stood in this identical spot at the moment the shot was fired. Was it possible that the skulking assailant had feared that the phantom was about to make an important discovery, 
And was that why he had fired the shot? Culligore pondered the question while scanning every square inch of the pillar. Suddenly the electric gleam stopped at a point near the floor, and Culligore could scarcely repress an exclamation of elation. His ruse had succeeded, for on the white surface of the post was a faint discoloration, which signified that Starr's hand had recently touched that particular point. There were no other marks, and this one was only a few inches from the floor. Culligore's fingers ran quickly over the surrounding space, and occasionally he pressed his thumb firmly against the wood, but without discovering anything. His hand slid downward to where the rich Persian carpet was neatly tucked around the base of the post, and suddenly his exploring fingers touched a slight knob-like projection. He pressed firmly, and he felt an exultant tingle as there came a soft, whirring response. A panel in the post, ingeniously hidden in the gold-lined grooves, was sliding back, forming an aperture. The electric gleam showed a look of keen elation on Culligore's face. His discovery had taken only a minute or two of valuable time, for he had moved fast since he noticed that Star was gone. Yet, but for a happy inspiration and the resultant reddish stain on the post, he might have searched for days without finding the opening. Now he squeezed his figure through the narrow aperture, at the same time pocketing his electric flash and drawing his automatic. His feet encountered the upper rungs of a ladder that pointed straight down. He descended rapidly, making no sound. At the bottom was a narrow passage extending in the direction of the street, and at its farther end he saw a faint glow. He approached quickly, warned by a sixth sense that he had no time to waste. He came to a door. It stood open a crack, and through the narrow opening he saw a strange scene. An elderly man, with a thin and haggard face and sunken eyes that stared about him in an agonized way, was lying on a cot. Star, bending over the recumbent man, was winding pieces of rope around his feet and hands and drawing them into tight knots. "'There, Mr. Fairspeckle,' he tauntingly declared when he had fastened a gag around the other man's mouth. I don't think you will work loose a second time. Even if you should, you will find that the telephone is out of order. He laughed, turned away from the cot, and uttered a gasp as he looked into the muzzle of Culligore's pistol. Every trace of color faded from his face, but he gathered himself quickly. You are a most astounding person, Culligore, he remarked coolly. I wonder how you found your way down here. Not that it matters, he added with a shrug, but I am naturally curious. I won't press you for the information, however. Any way I can be of service? Yes, Mr. Shea, said Culligore, emphasizing each word and looking straight into the other's eyes. You can hold out your hands and not make any fuss while I put the handcuffs on you. Star laughed derisively. Sorry not to be able to oblige you, but I have a distinct aversion to handcuffs. Won't you sit down and be comfortable? An underground room like this has many advantages. In the chests you see against the walls, I occasionally store things that the police and private detectives would give a great deal to be able to lay their hands on. It is an excellent hiding place, and it serves several other purposes besides. "'So I see,' muttered Culligore with a glance at the man on the cot. Fairspeckle's face bore a dazed look, and he seemed to understand nothing of what was being said but his staring eyes held an expression of terror. "'I would like to know,' murmured Star, 
fixing his pale eyes on the lieutenant's inscrutable face, how and when you learned that I was Mr. Shea. I was under the impression that you suspected Fairspeckle. I meant you should be, said Culligore with a dry chuckle. I knew somebody was listening behind the marble ledge the day I had that talk with the gray phantom upstairs, and I guessed it was either you or one of your men. I pretended to believe that Fairspeckle was Mr. Shea, and I encouraged the phantom in thinking the same thing, but all the while I was talking for the benefit of the fellow behind the marble slab. I had a pretty good suspicion as to who Mr. Shea was, and I wanted to throw him off his guard. Once a man gets careless, it isn't hard to catch him. Starr grinned appreciatively. I'll admit that you are far shrewder than you look, Culligore, but I am not so sure that I have been guilty of carelessness. That remains to be seen. What I am curious to know is when you first began to suspect that I was Mr. Shea. You see, I have nothing to fear from you, so I frankly admit the fact. But I would like to know by what sort of reasoning you were led to suspect me. There wasn't any course of reasoning, said Culligore, maintaining a steady grip on his pistol. It was only a flash here and there. The first flash came when I saw the note Virginia Darrow sent you the night she died. I guessed then that she had learned in some way that you were Mr. Shea, and she wanted to tease you with it. A little later, when you were handed that bump on the nose, I didn't know exactly what to think. Then it came to me that, if you really were Mr. Shea, you would have yourself assaulted along with the others to turn suspicion away from you. It was a clever move, Mr. Starr, but it didn't fool me for long. Well, a number of other things happened that strengthened my suspicion, but I wasn't really sure until I walked into this room tonight. Starr scowled a little. You were a bit disappointing, Culligore. I had hoped you would give me an example of fine-spun deductive reasoning of that kind that always drips from the lips of storybook detectives. Just one more thing before we close this pleasant interview. How do you account for Mr. Fairspeckle? Oh, that part was fairly easy. Fairspeckle is a queer sort, but he never did any real harm. He's been troubled with insomnia and when a man can't sleep, he's likely to do any foolish thing, from writing poetry on a park bench to murdering his mother-in-law. The deeper the mystery, the simpler the explanation. That has been my experience, and it has held true in Fairspeckle's case. I'm not dead sure of my facts, but I can make a pretty close guess. The night Mr. Shea's notices were posted, Fairspeckle had been roaming the town, as he always did when he couldn't sleep. He saw one of the notices in Times Square, and, being one of the seven richest men in town, he didn't like the idea a bit. Then the gray phantom came strolling along, and Fairspeckle recognized him. Like many others, he jumped at the conclusion that the phantom was Mr. Shea and right away he began to study out a way of beating Mr. Shea's game. By some hook or crook he got the phantom into his apartment, and there he tried to drug him. He had two objects in view. One of them was to keep the phantom under cover for a time so he wouldn't be able to go on with his scheme, and the other was to get even with certain enemies of his by throwing an almighty scare into them while the real Mr. Shea, as he supposed, was a prisoner in his apartment, he meant to carry the scheme just a step or two farther, just far enough to put fear into his old enemies. It just so happened that five of those enemies were among the seven richest men in town. Well, Fairspeckle got a typewriter and went to work and typed a new set of notices, supplementing the ones that had already been posted. 
I hope he had a good laugh while he was typing the seven names, for that's all the good his scheme did him. A few hours later he was kidnapped. That was another fairly clever move, Star. Star seemed to enjoy the compliment. Thanks, Culligor, he murmured. I knew you would appreciate that little touch. After overhearing the conversation between you and the Phantom, in which I thought you made it plain that both of you suspected Fairspeckle, I saw a still more effective way to divert suspicion from myself. Since you already suspected Fairspeckle, as I thought at the time, it occurred to me to let the suspicion take firmer root by having Fairspeckle disappear. A man who vanishes mysteriously is always an object of suspicion. Culligore nodded absently. Only half his mind had been on Starr's speech. Now, still holding the automatic firmly leveled, he came a step closer to the other man. "'I don't like to muss you up,' he said softly. "'So please put out your hands and make no trouble.' Star chuckled amusedly. "'You are really surprisingly simple, Culligore. Your pistol doesn't frighten me, for I know you won't use it, and arresting me won't do you any good. If you put me in jail, the antidote will never be found, and then seven of the biggest men in the country will die. Don't you see, Culligore, that there isn't a thing you can do?' His tones were soft and teasing, and his words expressed the same idea that Culligore himself had voiced in Inspector Stapleton's presence. Slowly the lieutenant ran his eyes over the walls. The underground chamber, and especially the steel chest stacked along the side, would serve excellently as a hiding place. What more natural than the antidote should be concealed in one of the chests? It seemed... He got no farther in his reasoning. Too swiftly for Culligore to interfere, Star's hand moved to the wall at his side. A faint click sounded, and then blackness fell. Culligore sprang forward, but already a loud slam signified that the door had closed. He hurled himself against it, but he might as well have been pitting his strength against a brick wall. Trapped, he muttered. Chapter 21 Mr. Shea's Stratagem A swarm of jumbled thoughts and emotions crowded each fraction of a second as the gray phantom, standing with his back against the door, heard Slade's slow and precise voice pronounce the numerals. At each distinctly spoken word, he started as if a rapier had prodded his flesh. His gaze was fixed on Helen, who from her position in the stairway stared down on the scene with eyes that appeared to see nothing, and the blank look in her face told him that she was mercifully oblivious of the meaning of it all. With the speed of lightning, stray thoughts and impressions flashed through the phantom's mind, Slade had warned him that Helen would die when he had counted ten, unless the phantom surrendered in the meantime. At Helen's back, shielded by her body against a possible bullet from the phantom's revolver, stood the executioner, ready to press the trigger. Things swam in confusion before the phantom's eyes. He would gladly have given his life if thereby he could save Helen from her predicament but Slade dared not kill him just yet, not until he had learned where Dr. Tagala was hidden, and so he hoped to force the phantom into submission by threatening Helen. The plan was subtle and fiendishly clever, and more than once, as the seconds dragged by, the phantom had been on the point of yielding. The only thing that had restrained him was the belief that his surrender would only make the situation worse, it would deprive him of his precarious advantage, and then Helen's position would be doubly desperate. Once he glanced at the automatic in his hand, 
wishing that he could fire a bullet into the figure crouching behind Helen. It was a forlorn hope, for the coward knew better than to expose himself. Again Slade's voice, pronouncing each syllable with excessive precision, broke in upon his thoughts. Five, six, seven. The phantom jerked up his head as an inspiration flashed through his mind. He still had an advantage, though his aching mind had not been able to grasp it until this very minute. Again his eyes sought the pistol drooping from his nerveless right hand. Eight, nine. A note of hesitancy crept into Slade's accents, and he looked expectantly at the phantom. Evidently he was reluctant to pronounce the final word, the word that would mean Helen's death. He vastly preferred that the phantom should accept his terms, but his face showed no sign of yielding from his purpose. His lips opened, and in another moment the fatal word would have been spoken. But in that brief interval the phantom acted, and the word never left Slade's lips. Instead he uttered a long, drawn-out exclamation of amazement. The phantom's maneuver had been both swift and surprising. The blue steel of his automatic had flashed for an instant in the dim light, and then he had pressed its muzzle firmly against his heart. For a few moments the crowd stared in dumbfounded amazement. Then a startled look in Slade's face showed that he understood. He bit his lip and suppressed a cry of rage. "'If Miss Hardwick dies, I die too,' declared the phantom in gritty accents. And the metallic gleam of his eye and the note of grim earnestness in his voice left no doubt of his sincerity. "'And you can't afford to let me die, Slade. With me dead, you would never find Tagala, and then the bottom would drop out of Mr. Shea's scheme.' Slade fumed and gnashed his teeth in impotent rage. A glance at the phantom's face, smiling and yet grimly determined, seemed to increase his fury. But the phantom's airy confidence was all on the surface. He knew that his dramatic gesture had only postponed the crisis, and already his mind was planning another move. At last Slade's rage cooled and his reason reasserted itself. Pointing to the stairway, he bawled an order to the man behind Helen to take her back to her room. The phantom drew a long breath of relief as she was half led, half carried up the remaining steps, but the comfort the sight gave him was of brief duration. Now Slade's finger was pointing at himself. "'Take his gun away,' he ordered the men lined up behind him. "'Make a rush for him all at once, but don't shoot. Go!' The men bounded forward, but in the same instant the phantom's pistol spoke twice. Two yells of pain followed the sharp cracks of the weapon, and the leaders of the rush sank to the floor. The others stopped, stared diffidently at the steadily pointed pistol, then wavered and fell back. Once more the phantom had triumphed. He cast a quick glance at the two who had fallen. He had aimed to cripple, not to kill, and he could see that their wounds were not serious. Slade shook his fist at the cowering men. "'Are you all white-livered kittens?' he shouted. "'Are you going to let one man bluff you?' Rush at him again, all together. The phantom tensed himself for the attack. He quavered inwardly as he recalled that only two slugs remained in his cartridge chamber. He crouched behind the pistol, fixing each man in turn with a piercing gaze. The line advanced with a rush. Someone, more intrepid than the others, seized one of his legs and tried to pull him to the floor but the phantom disposed of him with a vigorous kick. The next was dispatched with a well-aimed bullet, and the third went reeling to the floor from a blow with the butt of his pistol. 
he took careful aim before he fired his one remaining shot and a scream of agony told that the bullet had found its mark again the line wavered and broke on the floor lay five who had been maimed by the phantom's bullets and one who was still unconscious from the blow at the pistol of the original eleven combatants only five remained but also the phantom's ammunition was spent and at any moment one or more of the wounded might revive and get back into the fray slade's face was white with helpless rage he could not know that the phantom's cartridge chamber was empty he stamped his foot and again shook his fist at the men taking advantage of his temporary distraction the phantom glided forward and stooping quickly snatched a pistol from the cramped fingers of one of the wounded then he threw down his own weapon and hurried back to his position at the door slade noticed his sudden move out of the tail of an eye but not soon enough to prevent it he turned again to the remnant of his little army his face was dark and wore an ominous scowl we will get him yet he declared snarling form a line and take aim but don't shoot to kill aim for the arms and legs only don't shoot until i give the word the men spread out in a half circle and the phantom saw five pistols pointing at him there was a malevolent grin on slade's lips as he watched the preparations then he stepped to one side of the half circle fire he commanded the phantom ducked just as a chorus of shots rang out a stinging sensation in the shoulder told him he had been hit but he choked back the cry of pain that rose in his throat a dense film of powder hung in the air and for a few moments the firing line was only a row of shadowy forms the phantom thought of flight but someone opened a window and the smoke quickly scattered in the next instant the blare of a motor horn was heard in the distance the men exchanged quick glances and the phantom fancied he saw a look of relief in slade's face in the muttered conversation that followed he made out the name of mr shea and new misgivings caused him to forget the stinging pain in his shoulder slade's handling of the situation had exposed him as a bungler but for Mr. Shea's ingenuity and resourcefulness, the Phantom had a high respect. If Mr. Shea had arrived, as the blare of the horn and the conversation among the men seemed to signify, then a new and more critical situation awaited him. He glanced toward the end of the hall. A faint glimmer of dawn showed against the window back of the stairway railing. The night had been crowded with exciting events, and the time had passed more quickly than he realized. Again Mr. Shea's name was mentioned among the men, and then a hush fell over the group. A door opened at one side of the hall, and in the next instant the phantom's eyes widened into a bewildered stare. The tall man who entered and was received with such marked deference by Slade and the others was none other than vincent starr a film floated before the phantom's eyes it seemed almost unbelievable at first but a succession of minor incidents and circumstances that had vaguely puzzled him at times suddenly came back to him in the light of a new significance he had been blind he told himself yet it was no wonder that he had been deceived his concern for Helen had been uppermost in his mind, and he was forced to admit that Starr had played his game very shrewdly. The newcomer cast a swift, comprehensive glance up and down the hall, then turned to Slade, and the two engaged in a low-voiced conversation. Now and then Starr mentioned Culligore's name, and the phantom gathered from isolated words and phrases that something of an unpleasant nature had happened to the lieutenant. He learned, too, that there had been developments that necessitated quick action on Mr. Shea's part, 
and that the latter had made a quick motor trip from New York to Azurecrest. The Phantom absorbed these bits of news with interest, but all the time he was studying the characteristic gestures with which Starr emphasized his statements. Once before, while standing in the Thelma Theater, it struck him that there was something familiar about them, and the same impression came to him now. He was searching his memory for half-forgotten facts when Starr suddenly turned round and faced him. Surprised? he inquired, and his smile exposed two rows of flashingly white teeth. A little, at first, but I think I understand it all now, was the phantom's nonchalant reply. Then, of a sudden, his figure stiffened. Starr had delivered another of his oddly expressive gestures, and it had started another train of recollections in the phantom's mind. Star, he added impulsively, you were once a member of my organization. Only a very humble one, admitted Star, and it was years back, so it's no wonder you didn't recognize me at first. In those days you scarcely noticed me, but I was watching and studying you all the time. There were a lot of melodramatic notions in my head, and the gray phantom was my hero. I dreamed of some day eclipsing his achievements, and I think I have succeeded. You see, the Thelma Theater, for all the fun I got out of the experiment, was only a cover for my other and more fascinating activities. My first impression was correct, then, murmured the phantom, addressing himself rather than Star. I suspected Mr. Shea was a former follower of mine, and had learned his methods from me, and that's why I decided to defeat his purpose and break up his organization. Now I'm doubly glad that I took up the cudgels against you, Star. Glad? A puzzled frown crossed Star's face. You are a beaten man, defeated by a once insignificant pupil of yours. Why should you be glad? Defeated? The phantom threw back his head and smiled. Not just yet, Star. The gray phantom doesn't even know the meaning of the word. Before I drop out of this game, you and your crowd will be in jail. A cloud gathered on Star's forehead. You are a curious character. I have beaten you at every turn. I have you so completely cornered that you can't even raise your pistol against me without endangering the life of a certain person whom you are deeply interested in. By the way, Slade has bungled this situation. He tells me that you have kidnapped Dr. Tagala and refused to tell where he is hidden. He has told you the exact facts. You will never see Tagala again until I release him. And that I won't do until Miss Hardwick has been freed and the antidote turned over to me. Starr's lips curled scornfully. As I said, Slade has bungled the situation. He doesn't seem to understand what kind of persuasion to exert on a man like you. I think I can suggest an improvement. Miss Hardwick, as I think you know, received a dose of datura poison calculated to produce death within seven days what is the matter he added quickly as the phantom winced and touched his left shoulder ah you have been wounded only a scratch said the phantom coolly despite the sharp twinges that now and then shot through the injured shoulder what about miss hardwick as I said, the injection she received was calculated to kill within seven days. As you know, if you read the accounts of Virginia Darrow's death, the dose can be so adjusted as to produce death in a much shorter time, say fifteen minutes or half an hour. Dr. Tagala, who is a very fascinating gentleman, explained the method to me very carefully. I don't quite see— began the phantom, 
an uneasy flicker in his eyes, but Starr had already turned to his lieutenant. Slade, he crisply commanded. In one of the drawers of the desk in the laboratory you will find several bottles of Datura poison. Bring me one of those marked Series A. Fetch a hypodermic syringe, too, and be quick about it. Slade withdrew. A horrifying suspicion was entering the phantom's mind. Starr's methods were subtler and far more frightful than his subordinates. "'You look faint,' observed Starr, with a glance at the phantom's face. A trace of sarcasm edged his words. "'I'm afraid the wound is very painful. Too bad Dr. Tagala isn't here to treat it.' The phantom was about to reply, but just then Slade returned and handed his superior a syringe and a small bottle containing a dark liquid. Starr studied the label for a moment. "'Correct,' he murmured. "'It's fortunate Dr. Tagala taught me how to use a syringe. In a few moments Miss Hardwick will have received a second dose of Datura poison.' one that will kill her inside half an hour, unless Dr. Tagala should administer the restorative in the meantime. A cry broke from the phantom's lips. The severe pain in the shoulder, together with the terrifying realization that had just flashed through his mind, made him suddenly dizzy. He leaned weakly against the wall. In the same instant, Starr, quick to seize the opportunity, wrenched the pistol from his hand. "'This is ever so much better,' he murmured elatedly. "'I think you will be willing to produce Dr. Tagala as soon as I have injected the second dose of poison into Miss Hardwick's veins. Hold him, Slade, till I come back.' He instructed one of the other men to follow him and hurried away, but his words kept dinning in the phantom's consciousness. He made a strong effort to fight down the treacherous weakness that was stealing over him. He wondered why his eyes saw nothing but whirling specks, and why his knees shook so. The loss of blood, he reflected, must have weakened him more than he had realized. Suddenly everything went black, and with a despairing moan he sank to the floor. He heard Slade's derisive laugh but it had an unreal and faraway sound. "'Dead to the world,' muttered Slade, and the phantom was dimly conscious that someone was bending over him. "'Well, I hope for the girl's sake that he comes to before the half-hour is up.'" Chapter 22 The Phantom's Ruse the words had an electrifying effect on the phantom's nerves. Not more than a minute could have passed since Starr's departure, and his imagination pictured the scene that soon would be enacted in Helen's room. He strove valiantly to shake off the numbness that had been brought on him by horror and loss of blood. Out of his half-closed eyes he saw Slade standing in a listless attitude a few feet from where he lay. Evidently he was depending on the phantom's unconsciousness to last a while longer, for he was idly toying with his pistol and seemed rather bored. Two of the other men were removing their wounded comrades, and for the moment no one was observing the phantom. A sharp realization that he must act at once quickened his thoughts and stirred his energies. His mental picture of Helen and her desperate peril stimulated his reserve forces of mental and physical vigor. Warily he glanced about him, then crawled swiftly and silently toward the point where Slade stood. Suddenly he rose to his knees and jerked the pistol from Slade's hand. In another moment he was on his feet, stifling Slade's loud cry for help by a blow with the weapon. Without a glance behind, he ran as fast as he could in the direction taken by Starr. His mind was already at work on a plan. A new force, more powerful than mere bodily strength, seemed to speed him on. 
Despite physical weariness and the sharp twinges in his shoulder, he felt as if nothing could resist him. If only there was yet time! Reaching the top of the stairs, he turned at random in the hall. A low, drawling chuckle, uttered in a voice he recognized as Star's, drew his attention to one of the doors near the end of the corridor. He approached cautiously and looked in. What he saw assured him that he had arrived in time. He took in the scene with a single glance. A powerful man, one of those he had fought in the hall below, was seated on the edge of the cot, holding Helen's weakly resisting hand in his huge paws. In the center of the room, with a smile of gratification on his lips, stood Vincent Starr, and the phantom saw that he was transferring the contents of the bottle to the syringe. Evidently it was a slow and tedious task. The phantom waited until Starr had finished. He flexed his muscles, then lunged forward. Before either of the two men could move, the handle of his pistol crashed down on the head of the individual seated on the cot. With a queer, fragmentary squeal, he slid from his seat and lay prone on the floor. In an instant, the phantom had whirled on Star, who seemed completely taken back by the sudden interruption, and jerked the syringe and the empty bottle from his hands. Then, with all the strength he could muster, he crashed his fist into Star's jaw and sent him spinning to the floor. Thrusting the empty bottle into his pocket and gingerly handling the syringe, he fled from the room. Despite his pain and weakness, he smiled as he sped on. Once more the gray phantom's quick mind and elastic energies were about to reverse a seemingly hopeless situation. But the danger was not yet past, and the hardest task was still to come. Star, only partly stunned, would soon recover his wits, and then, with a hue and a cry, the pursuit would start. The thought made the phantom quicken his pace as he ran toward the entrance of the hidden chamber. A din and clamor sounded in the distance as he reached the point where a sliding panel in the wall afforded egress to the spiral stairway. Quickly closing the opening behind him, he ran down the steps. The pursuers, he knew, would never be able to locate the entrance, and for the present he was safe. He stepped inside the room and switched on the light, then placed his automatic, the syringe, and the empty bottle on the table. Dr. Tagala was lying on the bed, just as the phantom had left him. As the light went on, he gave a hoarse gasp of amazement and tried desperately to rise. "'Didn't expect to see me so soon again, eh, doctor?' The phantom removed his coat and proceeded to clean and bandage his wound as well as he could. You tricked me very neatly, I'll admit, but the ruse didn't quite succeed. Even if it had, don't you realize that you would have been left here to starve to death? The doctor continued to stare at the phantom, who rather enjoyed his stupefaction. He glanced at the bed from time to time, while he took several articles from a cupboard and dressed his wound. When he had finished, Tagala began to strain uneasily at the cords fettering his hands and feet. "'Useless exertion, doctor,' advised the phantom. He walked to the bed and regarded the physician with a frown. Then he quickly took the syringe from the table and placed a knee on Tagala's chest. Tagala squirmed and heaved, but to no avail. With his left hand, the phantom took one of the scientist's arms and pressed it firmly downward. "'Steady now, doctor. This is only a dose of your own medicine, you know. You seemed quite proud of it when you told me how you discovered it.' The phantom took the syringe in his right hand, between thumb and forefinger, and pricked the doctor's flesh with the needle-like point. "'I'm a rank amateur at this, but I'll try to manage.' I believe the proper way is to inject the stuff into a vein, but that's a ticklish job, and I won't attempt it. 
This method is a little slower, but just as effective. The scientist, at last perceiving the phantom's aim, struggled frantically to free himself, but the ropes and the pressure against his chest rendered him helpless. Slowly and firmly, the phantom pressed against the piston with his index finger, gradually discharging the contents of the syringe into the physician's tissue. Tagala soon ceased struggling, and the look of mute agony in his face told that he had an acute realization of his extremity. Finally, the phantom tossed the empty syringe aside and removed his knee from the doctor's chest. Then he picked up the empty bottle and held it so Tagala could read the label. "'Series A!' gasped the doctor, and a grayish pallor overspread his hideous features. "'You seem to know what it means,' observed the phantom. "'Star took pains to assure me that the contents of this particular bottle would produce death in thirty minutes. Now, doctor, don't you think you had better tell me where the antidote is hidden, truthfully this time?' Every trace of color had fled from the scientist's face. He glared at the phantom with a mingling of dread and rage in his eyes. "'Yes,' he groaned at length. "'I will tell you. You have me where I can do nothing else. But if I tell you, you will bring me a bottle of the antidote?' "'Assuredly. I am not a murderer. It isn't for me to punish you for your crimes.' I am resorting to this method only because it seems the only way to influence you to save eight lives. You give me your word of honor? My word of honor. Tagala heaved a vast sigh. Very well, then. The other time I gave you an accurate description of the bottles, although I deliberately deceived you in regard to where they were. He spoke fast and raspingly as if realizing that every moment was precious. "'Listen carefully,' he went on, and then he gave the phantom clear and detailed directions which the latter memorized. He knew that this time Tagala, actuated by mortal fear, was telling the truth. His pulses throbbed exultantly as he left the room and hurried up the steps. Shouts and scurrying feet told that Star's men had not yet given up their search for him. The hardest and most dangerous part of the task was still ahead of him. The slightest accident or misstep might yet cheat him of the hard-earned success that now seemed so near. He groped forward cautiously, tightly clutching his pistol, infinitely alert against the slightest sign or sound of danger. The searchers were evidently in another part of the house, for he reached the laboratory without encountering anyone. He throbbed and tingled with suspense and excitement as he entered. Doubts and fears came back to him. Had Dr. Tagala lied to him, after all? Did the wily Mr. Shea have still another ruse in reserve? Was he once more walking into a trap? Would Helen and himself be able to escape from Azure Crest with the precious antidote in their possession? He was torn between maddening misgivings and serene hopes as he crossed the floor of the laboratory. Tagala had mentioned a closet in a corner of the room where, in an ingeniously concealed hiding place, he would find the bottles. His heart raced fast and hard as he stepped inside. His hands trembled, and there was an insistent throbbing at his temples as he began to follow out the scientist's directions. Ten minutes later, with pockets bulging and a great joy in his heart, he emerged from the closet. He had found ten small bottles in all, and each one, according to the directions on the label, contained a full course of treatment. The antidote in his possession was more than sufficient to save the lives of all of Mr. Shea's victims. But he had promised to deliver one bottle to the doctor, and with the phantom a promise was a promise, even when made to a blackguard of Tagala's type. It would mean delay and additional risks, 
but he would not go back on his word. Holding the automatic in readiness for instant action, he began to make his way back to the secret chamber. He had covered about half the distance when suddenly he heard a shout at his back. It was followed by a sharp command to halt. Other voices took up the cry until the house resounded with a chorus of harsh and excited exclamations. Clear and loud, issuing commands to right and left, the voice of Vincent Starr was heard above all the others. The phantom paid no heed. He ran swiftly along, feeling that everything in life depended upon his ability to elude the pursuing throng. A pistol cracked spitefully. Then a bullet, aimed low, whistled past his knees. The phantom ran faster and faster, summoning all his remaining strength. Now he was only a few feet from the wall, but a swift backward glance told him that the nearest of his pursuers was almost at his heels. He found the deftly hidden knob that controlled the sliding door and pressed it. The wall parted, and in an instant he had passed through the opening. But someone was already tearing at his coat, and he could not close the aperture behind him. Carried on by their momentum, several men pressed and shoved against his back, pushing him precipitately down the spiral stairs. One by one, his pursuers rushed through the opening at the top shouting wildly as they slid and tumbled down the perpendicular stairway. "'Get him!' shouted Starr, one of the last to pass through the opening. "'Don't let him get away this time!' A sense of bafflement took hold of the phantom as he saw his pursuers pouring into the little chamber, but of a sudden the glow of an inspiration came over his face. The accident that had prevented him from closing the opening had been a thing in his favor. He had left the light on upon leaving the room the other time, and now a touch of his finger plunged the chamber into darkness. He knew it would be some time before the others found the switch. Groping in the dark, he slowly made his way to the cot and thrust a bottle of the antidote into the hook of Tagala's arm. The others would have to cut his ropes later. Elbowing his way among men running wildly hither and thither in the darkness, he came to the foot of the stairs once more. Quickly he tiptoed to the top and closed the sliding panel, well knowing that Starr's men would be unable to master the mechanism that controlled it. He chuckled softly as he descended again and once more mixed with the scampering throng below. "'Where is the phantom?' shouted a voice which he recognized as Stars. "'Get him, men, get him. We may lose millions if he slips away from us. Can't someone make a light?' The phantom was crouching in a corner. "'Better give Tagala a hand,' he called out. "'He is badly in need of help. And don't worry about your millions. They will be the least of your troubles after this.' He darted across the floor before the others had recovered from their amazement. Pushing and wriggling, he reached the opposite wall. He fumbled along its surface until he found a hidden lever. At his touch, a narrow door slid noiselessly open. Beyond it was the tunnel by which he had entered the house upon his arrival. For an instant, before closing the door behind him, he paused in the opening. "'Star!' he called, an ecstatic throb in his tones. "'The gray phantom always wins in the end.' The door closed, and the phantom started toward the other end of the tunnel. Star and his men would remain prisoners in the chamber until the police could reach Azure Crest and take them into custody. With a brisk step, wholly unconscious of the pain in his shoulder, the gray phantom hurried toward the light of day and Helen. Chapter 23 The End of the Gray Phantom A thin and stoop-shouldered old man, with a kindly gleam in his sunken eyes, gave the phantom a warm handclasp when, three days later, 
he walked into the drawing room of the Hardwick's residence. "'How is Miss Hardwick?' was his first question. "'As well as ever, sir,' declared her father. "'The antidote seems to have worked like a charm. I needn't tell you that I am deeply grateful to you, and—' He paused and looked uncertainly at the phantom. "'I wonder if you can ever forgive me for intercepting those letters. I was a meddlesome old fool.' "'You did what you thought best, Mr. Hardwick. Anyway, all's well that ends well. Please don't think about the matter.' "'Thank you for saying that. I'll call my daughter immediately.' He withdrew, and the phantom sat down. His eyes were keen and bright, and there was a new vim and confidence in his manner. He had several reasons for feeling highly elated. Starr and his men, trapped in the secret chamber, had been lodged in jail. The seven capitalists were recovering rapidly following the administration of the antidote. Starr, after a thorough sweating by the police, had grudgingly revealed the whereabouts of Culligore and Fairspeckle, and they had been rescued from their uncomfortable position under the Thelma Theatre. Incidentally, the room had been found to contain a great amount of loot stored up by Starr's organization. The full story of the Grey Phantom's achievements had been published in the newspapers, and strong efforts were being made to have all outstanding indictments against him squashed. His adventure had been successful in every respect. He sprang up as Helen, with a wild rose flush in her rather pale cheeks, ran into the room. "'Gray Phantom,' she whispered. His smile was a trifle sad. "'The Gray Phantom is dead,' he murmured. Then his face brightened. A whimsical light came into his eyes. But in my gardens at Sea Glimpse I am trying to bring out a little gray orchid that is to be planted on his grave, symbolizing whatever was good in him. I am thinking of calling it the Phantom Orchid. How poetic! she exclaimed. But I don't quite like to think of the gray phantom as dead. He was so splendid in many ways, just like the hero of my poor little play. All he needed was to have the good in him brought to the surface. And that reminds me, the hero of my play was you." The phantom nodded. I was conceited enough to suspect it as soon as I saw the reviews in the papers. Helen looked as if her thoughts were wandering away from the present. The weirdest experience of my life was when I saw Starr enact the role of the hero in my play. He actually lived the part, and it was then I first suspected he was Mr. Shea. The phantom seemed puzzled. I am not sure I can explain. The idea that Starr was Mr. Shea came to me like a flash, yet there was quite a little feminine logic behind it. My hero was modeled after you, but Star enhanced the resemblance. He introduced things that were not in my play, but which made the similarity between my hero and you all the more striking. His gestures and mannerisms were all yours. As I sat there marveling at it, the name of Mr. Shea suddenly leaped into my mind. I think Virginia Darrow must have felt the same thing. From time to time she looked at Star in the strangest way, as if she had suddenly made a startling discovery. Hmm, mumbled the phantom. Perhaps that was why she sent Star that facetious note. Afterward my impressions grew somewhat confused, Helen continued. The whole thing, Star's acting and Miss Darrow's strange conduct, seemed sort of unreal. It was as if an illusion had been shattered the moment Star disappeared from the stage and the curtain went down. The officers argued that Mr. Shea could be nobody but the Gray Phantom. Their arguments made me very uneasy, and after my talk with Culligore the next day I felt I must see you. 
On the impulse of the moment I got on a train. She shuddered a little as if some horrifying recollection had come back to her. It all seems like an ugly dream, and I am not sure even now that I am quite awake. For a time they sat silent, gazing dreamily into the soft sunlight. Helen, said the phantom at length, I feel as if a great black cloud has lifted from my life. I feel that way, too. He found her hand and held it. For a moment his thoughts went back to the day when his fingers had first touched hers. Helen, he murmured, you and I have schemed together and dreamed together and shared all sorts of dangers together. I wonder if we couldn't... Her misty bright eyes met his. A smile, warm, radiant, and tender, came to her lips. Yes, she whispered. Why couldn't we? 